Hello, everybody on YouTube. What is going on? How is your night going as we are getting ready to fire up another great show here on Spaced Out Radio as we are one day away from the weekend. And I'll tell you, it is going to be a fantastic show tonight. I highly recommend you guys sitting back, buckling up, and getting the popcorn ready because we're about to turn the jets on for this one. Before we bring in Corey Daniel, let's say hello to everyone in our chat room tonight. We got Mike L in the gold medal position. Race fan takes home silver. And taking home the bronze tonight is the gorgeous and talented Emily Bigelow. There she is, a.k.a. Alaska's greatest athlete. Jan Yannick takes home fourth. And we have Trucker Andrew sitting in fifth. SJ goes in sixth, and we just continue on from there. Carl stuck a tr probe in my ass. How you doing, buddy? Good to have you back. I hope you got lubed up at least first. That would be very, very important. Sultry Susie and Jan Yannick, thank you for joining us. Really do appreciate it. And uh, let me just get reset here. All right. There we go. The gorgeous and talented KT, thank you for coming on in. Really appreciate you. The lovely and talented Jenny Metz and the gorgeous and stunning Dal Booper here, everyone. There she is. She'll be signing autographs after the show. We have the lovely Cosmic Floor, typical watch in Parkway. How you doing? Parkway, by the way, will be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the left for Parkway, to the right for Cosmic Floor, if you don't mind. Mark Eddy, nice to see you. Scott Brown, the Ronald Penton, everyone. And Sassy Sandra, how you doing? John Hires, thank you for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. Really do appreciate your love and support of Spaced Out Radio. The gorgeous and talented Florida Steph Dickey is here, everyone. Give her a wave. Hey, Mental Pancakes and Stunning Jewels, how are you? Dirt Road, good to see you, my friend. Thank you for coming on in, Mental Pancakes. And uh, first time here, we have Ruthann Amartafio. Amartafio, there we go. Lovely and talented Ruth Ann is here. Welcome to Spaced Out Radio's chat room for the first time. Good to have you here. And uh, scrolling on down, Blenium and Asteroid. Good to see you guys. Thank you for coming on in. And uh, Golden Lee A is here, everyone. She likes to, a good wave, so make sure you wave to her. She would appreciate that. Hi, Nikki and 5900 buck. Ozzy Ozzy, oi oi to you. And Ozzy Ozzy, sister, sister. Good to see you. Jay Breezy and Steve the Australian, good to have you here. Richard Elmore and Dirty Filth, nice to see you guys. Bassmaster, good to have you here, my friend. Thank you for joining us. Hi there, Joshua and Jeffrey DeRuin, good to see you guys. And uh, I think I'm caught up on that end. Let's scroll this bad boy on down. And uh, Uncle Dale and his power stash are here, everyone, which means if you go to Austin, Texas, and you run into Uncle Dale, rub his power stash for good luck. It is said that you can extend your life by three days by rubbing Uncle Dale's power stash. Give it a try if you find him. Michael Lestuka and James Fadekey, good to see you guys. The gorgeous wrench, Princess Denali is here, everyone. Hi, Project Blue Book and Magnus, nice to see you guys. The gorgeous and talented Tristan Stevens is here. And uh, we're glad to have her. Sarah from Burbank, or no, that's Sarah Dawn Burbank. I apologize. She's looking lovely tonight. And my gorgeous wrench, Jenny, is here. Howard, nice to see you, my friend. Sinister Vax, good to have you here, buddy. How are you doing? Hope you had a good evening. Uh, I think I may have forgotten somebody up here. Let me just scroll up for a minute. Um, nope, that was me. That was me, I forgot. Hey, Spaced Out Radio, how you doing? Uh, Jose, how you doing, my friend? Good to see you. And uh, yeah, we're going to get going here in about 45 seconds. You know, a good way to support this show is if you're new, hit that thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, ring that bell so you know when we are live seven days a week here at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time. And of course, the Super Chat is open, which is a great way to support this show too. Hi, Awesome Cat Chaser. Nice to have you here. We're going to get going here in about 28 seconds. And our guest tonight is Corey Daniel. He has got a fantastic beard, everyone. I'm telling you, you guys liked my beard when I had it. This one is just as impressive. John Jackson and Mike D for life. Welcome to Spaced Out Radio's chat room. Thank you for joining us. Really do appreciate it. We're going to get going here in about 10 seconds, everyone. We're going to have a great time tonight. So sit back, relax, enjoy, turn up the woo, because here comes the train. Here we go. 
From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show and our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. Corey Daniel is a writer, researcher, and a professional guide currently living in Phoenix, Arizona. Raised in the Valley of the Sun, the Phoenix Mountain Preserves provided a passion for ethnobotany and later everything Native American and Old West. At the age of 18, he found himself in Wikiup, Arizona, where he spent the next decade roaming around the Big Sandy Valley. This time was spent studying religion, physics, poetry, botany, philosophy, primitive survival, traditional archery, and the occult. Here, he rode for a local ranch working cattle the old-fashioned way and teamed up with an old prospector to explore the surrounding mountains and valleys. Many afternoons were spent in trading posts listening to first-hand accounts of ruins, lost mines, secret springs, and the caves deep in the desert. This is going to be a great show tonight. The PhoenixEnigma.com is the website for Corey Daniel. Corey, thank you so much for joining us on Spaced Out Radio. Thank you for having me here. Appreciate it. All right. Glad to be here. Glad to have you here as well, my friend. So let's get to know you a little bit. This is your first time on this show. And and for our YouTube uh, viewers and our Twitch viewers, viewers, that is, I mean, that is one fantastic beard, my friend. That is one fantastic <laughs> beard. Let's just get it out of the way. I'm a little jealous right now. I almost braided it for you, sir. I almost braided oh. it, but so I didn't want to show off tonight. Maybe the next time. That would have been way too much for me. Way too much for me. <laughs> And I'm going to be honest with you because our our music guru, Ron Bumblefoot Thal, he braids his goatee and it's literally halfway down his chest. And I look at that as, as almost, you know, a piece for the gods. That's for sure. <laughs> this is great. I, I like Mike L's comment in our chat room right off the bat. The beard gods are pleased tonight. <laughs> that's funny. Well... Um, I could say it's all me, but my girl, you just met her a minute ago off air there. She makes me uh, my own personal beard balm. So it's, uh, it's nice and healthy. Oh, very nice. Very nice. And uh, let's say hi to Alicia as well. There she is. She's yeah, in she our is. chat room tonight. Mm -hmm. So we welcome her. I, I want to ask you right off the bat. I mean, you, you chose a life path that most do not choose. And yet, you know, here you are a number of years later, mm -hmm. you, you are somebody who is filled with serving the serving the public and trying to find the answers to some of these biggest mysteries. Take us down this path on how you became the man you are. Uh, it is true. I am unencumbered by the burden of academic credentials. Um, I was a horrible, horrible student back in, um, back in school. Um, I, I, I absolutely hated school. It was just public education. You know, it was uh, the uh, public indoctrination system here in America. Um, I could see even then I, I knew instinctively how, how bad it was. Um, and I just couldn't wait to get out. I was always in the mountains and the desert pre preserves around the house. Um, I had a, a pull, uh, towards, towards plants and botany, um, and towards mysteries and the occult and hidden knowledge. And, um, I, um, I, I tell you one, one of the biggest, one, one of the biggest things that set me off was I used to mow lawns. Um, uh, my dad said, I wanted a truck when I was 16, I had to make my own money and I mowed for a couple and her husband died. And uh, she was a widow. My dad told me I was going to keep mowing her lawn, but I couldn't take money. So long story short, um, she began teaching me uh, botany and herbs. And um, she was an English lady. 
Um, and um, I learned herbs and herb craft and tinctures and uh, decosions and infusions and poultices and salves uh, for, with, the, with the European herbalism. And this is probably towards middle school. And then I started learning, you know, it was years. I'm like, you know, the Native Americans had to have had to have uh, known how to use the plants out here. You know, I mean, I didn't know we didn't have the Internet back then. Right. And um, there were no cool shows on and there was not a lot of books out there on this topic. And I discovered finally the name ethnobotany. And that's the study of the relationship between plants and people for edible, medicinal, utilitarian and spiritual purposes. And I went and found some books kind of towards the early 90s, a couple um, ethnobotanists out of uh, Tucson um, started writing these uh, field guides and I went out and loved it. And about that time I moved up to uh, the, the desert and I studied plants. I was out there every day. I got a Weeds of the West book, um, great photos, uh, Weeds of Arizona. I mean, all these books, the whole, right, this one right here, it's all uh, botany back there, uh, regional botany. Um, during this time, I studied quite a bit of uh, Native Native American stories as well. And like it said in the bio there, I uh, really got into um, um, the Old West prospecting and uh, that old prospector, that old prospector I met up there in the desert. Um, he handed me a book by William Cooper called Behold a Pale Horse. I'm sure you've heard of it. And um, I read that and that was it. Then a little bit of David Icke um, and just the mystery started piling up. I moved back to the valley, Phoenix, that is. And, um, I, I uh, took a job, um, well, we lost our business. I took a job into the uh, hotel industry and, uh, started falling back in love with my own Valley and studying the deep history of Phoenix. Cause you know, growing up here, it's like, it's hot. There's nothing to do, right? It's the eighties. It's, it's Phoenix. But when you start studying the history under the history and pulling it apart in the, 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 the um, the, um, um, uh, fringe history, Phoenix is amazing. It's one of, one of the most important places, uh, currently in the United States of, of America. It's growing the fast with the fast growing County. Bill Gates is down here building a huge um, uh, thing called Belmont. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening in Phoenix and there's a lot of reasons for that. We can get into it to them later, but from there, all my knowledge of occult and occultism, masonry, witchcraft, I practiced the craft for 20 years back in the, the, the day, which shook me into physics, sorcery and technology and physics is all the same thing. Um, and um, that's kind of where I'm at today. I, I, um, I, I gave birth to a, uh, a website called the Phoenix Enigma.com where we started, I started writing about Phoenix and this alternative history in the area. And that, uh, that place where, where ancient knowledge meets government and meets, um, um, well, the events of the, 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 the day. And because I had a history in rituals and ceremony and occultism or hidden knowledge, um, I started de-occulting and I began de-occulting all of this, uh, modern day events, uh, from presidential speeches to, um, uh, you know, tragedies that are occurring. And that just kind of launched my YouTube channel. And, um, I'm a, I'm a professional guide. I have been for oh, about 10 years or so now, I guess. And, uh, you know, the ancient history of Arizona with the occult and my home and living in the most, uh, phenomenal of times to be alive and ever in the history of, of hu humanity, it all just dovetailed. And here I am just doing what I do. You have been someone who has found that strength to really to really choose your own path and choose your own adventure, much like a children's book, you know, back in the day that we used to read when, you know, when libraries were actually important. And I, I'm curious why this path? Why, why if you were a, a you know, self-proclaimed poor student, did you want to all of a sudden have this quest for knowledge and the way things were compared to how they are now? I know there's something wrong. There's something fundamentally broken with the American system, with the world today. We're being herded. Um, I can feel it. Everyone can feel it. The technocracy that's the, 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 that's coming down. Um, people staring at their phones. Um, the current situation we can't talk about on the show. We're on Trestle Radio, but the the, the the situations in the in the news everywhere right now, and the battling going back and forth, and the legislation. We are being. And I used to I used to work cattle. I know what it is to herd cattle. I know the techniques. I, I know what cattle look like when they're anesthetized. Okay. That's the human species right now. And we're getting worse and worse and worse. There's so much knowledge out there. Um, and we can get into some of the knowledge that I'm, 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 I'm speaking of, but people don't, people don't associate the modern day events, political events, uh, celebrations with this ancient sorcery. And it's about herd management. And my, I, I'm, I'm waking people up. I am what you call a truther. 
But but doesn't that also signify the fact that what what is old is new again? And you know, with history, we are always if you deny history, we are always doomed to repeat. The thing that hath been is that which shall be, to which is done, uh, what shall be done. There is nothing new under the sun. Um, Ecclesiastes, right? Um, yeah, uh, we are. There's nothing new. Um, I am personally of the opinion that we were seated here, um, our species. Um, the topics that we discuss in a microcosm, I believe all, all <laughs> jellify into the larger, um, the larger narrative. And like I said, I've, I've worked cattle. I've been a manager. I had a successful business with my father here in the Valley at 140 employees. I've done management, middle management. I've been at the bottom, you know, it's like kid rock said, I've slept in dumpsters and I've been high with Kings. I've done it all. Money does not move me. Um, the quest for knowledge and waking people up, freedom is my ultimate goal. And I want to see people have the ability um, and the knowledge. You, you, you cannot be free without, without truth. Um, if, if, if the narrative is kept, if the narrative is scripted and you're getting that narrative, whether it's in your news, your social media, or from your friends at the water cooler at work, you do not have the information available to to make educated choices and be free. And right now, and again, again, this gets into censorship. It gets into, um, you're in, you're in media. Um, you know, you're on social media, you know, how bad it's getting. I know how bad it's getting. I've been deplatformed off many, many places. Um, this is a very personal issue with me and that's what drives me. That's what drives right. me. You know, I, I had one of those situations a few weeks ago where I literally, I play by the rules because being on the side of the media and actually having a media background like I do, you kind of know where to draw the line and where you don't. And with this show, I always try to draw the line somewhere below, you know, the the tipping point. Mm -hmm. And four weeks ago, I got obliterated by Twitter. Mm -hmm. Spaced Out Radio got obliterated by Twitter. No, I mean, not Twitter, pardon me, Facebook. Mm -hmm. And all of our platforms on Facebook were except one were dissipated. We lost 14,000 subscribers. And the problem is because this is a private business, you can't just go ask somebody, what did we do? Explain to me what we did that, that broke the, the, the community standards as they hide behind, you know, what are the community standards? Because and what are those? <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> no I mean, so, so I understand exactly what you're what you're doing and and what you're what you're all about i mean basically what you're saying is you're calling bs on where you're you're sniffing bs and all you're doing is asking for the proper answers to the questions that you have and and in today's day and age unfortunately those questions seem to be rooted with a lot of trouble and, and fire from the majority of the public behind them yeah yeah i'm i am i um, that line that you drew, I erased that line a couple of years ago. Um, and I know I'm over the edge. I'm about 10 feet over the edge. I'm, I'm just hovering. I've, um, I lost my YouTube channel, 47,000 subscribers. Um, I lost my Facebook page. I lost my Periscope. Um, you know, and you know what? I'm of the opinion that if censor yourself, they're winning. Uh, yeah, I lost money. I lost good money on YouTube. Um, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop because the money doesn't move me. It's not about that. If, if, if people start changing what they're saying just to remain relevant on YouTube or wherever you're going to be at Facebook, Twitter, you're only going to be and you will, you will learn. They will teach you just like you train a horse, just like you train a farm animal. You will learn what you can and cannot get away with. And they will slowly get you there. And, um, that's how they're going to be controlling the, um, this, this, the, the, the dissemination of information. Um, that's where we're at right now. Uh, there's a, um, because I've been deplatformed so many times from so many places, um, the formula looks a lot like this to me. What they're doing is they'll come in and they'll kill my channel. Okay. What's left over in the industry is called runoff. They will then hire other personalities to come on, open up platforms. The algorithms will artificially accelerate them and that runoff will go over to them. And that is controlled opposition, controlled messaging, scripted narrative, i.e. propaganda. And if they do that enough times, the problem people, the people preaching the truth who cannot be controlled will be relegated to smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller platforms while the runoff gets funneled into controlled opposition. That's the war we're currently fighting for, for, for censorship right now in this country and on social media and what you and I do. 
uh, you went one one way. I decide I'm going to go the other way. Not that one's wrong or, or right. We need people at different levels in here. But um, if you ever watch my broadcasts over at DLive or Theta, D DLive just demonetized me too. DLive demonetized me. Um, we're pretty open. We're pretty outspoken. I mean, I know the rules on your show. You know, I said, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't cross those lines, but there are no rules on my show. And we call for people getting active. We call for people getting engaged. We call for people making a difference every day over there. Yeah, and and but let's be honest. I mean, the rules that I have to abide by are the FCC sure. and the CRTC. Yep, up here in Canada. So I have to be very careful about that. Just so people aren't aren't saying what that. Why are you doing this show? That spaced out radio has rules. No, I have to follow federal guidelines. That's right. It is is what it is. So mm -hmm. I mean. I want to ask you this, okay, without, you know, with trying to be as, as down the middle as possible, mm -hmm. what happened to critical thinking? Uh, we were trained into emotional thinking in this country. Um, you have a uh, second generation now of emotional thinkers that came out of the public indoctrination program. Pro pro programs. And I say this to this country, Canada and America, we're not so different. Um, it's pretty much the same plan. You guys are a little few years ahead of us in the, um, in, in the, uh, the government model that they would like, but, um, we're, we're about there. We're about there as well. Um, and that's what happens. We have emotional thinkers and we have the propaganda. You, you have a lot of right think going on, not, you know, uh, as in correct think people are scared to be called names people are scared to be um uh, categorized as a racist or a bigot or a homophobe or whatever and they know they throw those names around long enough and people will self-censor uh so people choose the narrative of emotional thinking and it, it's very it's a very technocratic form of 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 warfare you get people uh behaving a certain way for long enough and they're just going to start living that way um, self-censorship is, is the scariest thing when people lose their own, um, uh, ability to say what they believe is, 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 is right. But the critical thinking goes along with the elevation of the emotional thinking, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah, I, I agree with you, man. I, I agree with you. You know, like I, I mean, I, I have give you one example. I mean, yeah. um, uh, we, right now we have a border issue going on here in Arizona, Texas, right? Cal. Mm -hmm. California, you have a lot of people coming up, human beings, real human beings that deserve food, that deserve care, that deserve medicine, you know, all that stuff. And you, you have them coming to, to, to the, to the border and you have the media out there showing videos of them, you know, shaking the gate with their babies wanting, wanting through. That's an emotional plea. Let them through, let them through, let them through. Well, the logical thing is if you let them all through you, you know, especially in a de depression, you have, you have ramifications for that. If you don't vet them properly, you know, disease, uh, gang warfare, um, uh, you know, labor, labor is a, co is a commodity. You put, you bring too much into it and it goes down in value. So they hit you with the emotional thinking on that specific issue and, you know, damn the uh, consequences later on. And what does it do? Well, the voting is changing and all sorts of other political fallout from that. And that's one example of many. Um, and, you know, without getting into because I know your rules here. We can't get into all that stuff. Um, I could go down the list for seven hours straight. It's the emotional propaganda that's been cranked out during this last year here. Yeah. And I think it's pretty obvious. Look, look, I, I am someone who is has not discussed anything. I tr The reason why, and I'll explain, because I know you're, we're going to have a lot of listeners from your side wondering who who is this guy who has his thumb up his butt beside you talking here. The big thing for us here is our show where, where we kind of look at it. We're that show that takes everybody's mind away from things. You know, every day people are hammered with politics. Every day people are hammered with uh, conspiracy theories. Every day people are hammered with COVID. Our audience comes here because they know for those three hours that we're not going to be talking about it. Right. That they know that they can have a safe escape into some really cool topics, yeah. whether whether it's sacred geometry or whether yeah. it's symbolism, the occult, or whether it's UFOs, Bigfoot, or a ghost making love to a to a woman in a haunted house. Mm -hmm. That's that's where we kind of go and take people's minds away from things. So so I know before anybody gets critical on me, especially if they listen to the podcast or the radio show, we might as well bring it out in the air that sure. we're actually not that much different, you know, in what we do as trying to get a message out. There's, 
there are different approaches to doing it and, di and different genres and different focuses. And there's a place for that kind of radio and content because like any music, you need, you need spaces between the beats. You need pauses where there are nothing in order to, to make the song a song, uh, to use an, an analogy there. But, um, y y people need breaks. You're right. You're, you're, you know, and it, it's, it's good shows like this are, are out there. Yeah. And, and the biggest thing that we've seen here, Corey, is, is the fact that, that as we got about three minutes before we're going to go to break here, the bottom of the hour, the biggest thing that we've seen is people are tired. It doesn't matter whether you're, you're a pro masker, anti masker. It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat, a liberal, a Republican, or a conservative. People are tired. That's by design. Sure. That's that's that state sponsored PTSD. That's what it's designed to do. We we have been that's what we got hit with last year. We got hit with that along with the cognitive dissonance of mixed messaging every other day. And no one even in, in charge knowing what's going on, economy falling. That is that is that's PTSD. It's designed to uh well to create um uh trauma. We, we've all been traumatized. And this is what you do when you you tear something down before you build it back up again. And it's a Hegelian di dialect, you know, um, problem, reaction, sol solution. And uh, they tear it down. You have something waiting in the, the wings. And you say, oh, by the way, here's the answer. And everyone's like, oh, thank God there's something. And you pull it back together again and people will join into that new movement. Um, this is by design. It, this, is a, this is a technocracy. Someone mentioned AI a minute ago in your chat here. They're absolutely right. Uh, we have a lot of AI running a lot of stuff right now. And, and that absolutely terrifies me. Yeah. And you know what? I want to get in. And the reason why I was kind of holding off and hoping that you didn't see that question is because I actually want to <laughs> get in. I want to get into that with you when we come back from the break, because I'll be honest with you, AI, artificial intelligence, scares the daylights out of me. And, you know, not that I'm not that I'm like very conspiratorial in a lot of ways, but my God, is is the Terminator 2 movie coming out to play really strong here? It's Perfect amazing. It, it's amazing how Hollywood really picked that up. And I want to go in deep with you on that in the next half hour of the show, my friend, because AI, I think a lot of people are, are for it, but I think the majority of society, those who are not pulling the strings want nothing to do with it. Yeah. Yep. You know? So, I mean, as we got about 45 seconds here, uh, tease us a little bit, you know, you say you're scared by it. I am. Um, anytime you take human beings out of the equation of making decisions, uh, you're not going to have a very good outcome. You know, uh, the law of unintended con 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 consequence. You know who wrote a lot about this? Um, um, <laughs> he's not my hero by any stretch because he was a uh, he made some bad he made a bad choice. He made a few bad choices. But I'll tell you what, who people, if you want to read something interesting, go read the manifesto by Ted Kaczynski, the yes. Unabomber. People forget he was a Harvard professor and he wrote a 32 page manifesto about how computers were going to come in, take over. AI was going to come and make irrelevant human beings. And once that happened, your lives, my life, all of our lives um, collectively would go down in value and we would, we, we would no longer need people. All right. I'm going to get you to hold on right there, Corey, because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour here. Corey Daniel is here. The Phoenix Enigma. We're going to get into AI artificial intelligence is it good for mankind or are we going down a road of terminator where we're all going to be wiped out by robots aliens and whatever else the computers tell us that we got to do we'll be back right after this all right we're clear cool right on all right, uh, let's say a quick hello to gorgeous Alicia in the chat room tonight. The stunning Stephanie Jackson has come back to our chat room. Give us a wave there, Stephanie. We'd appreciate that. Why am I losing my voice? <clears throat> there we go. Uh, Chuggy Wuggy, welcome to the chat room. Now, usually I, I've kind of slowed down on this uh, for quite a while here, but um, Nucker has brought it up in the chat room and this is a real important question probably the toughest question I'm going to ask you all night what is your opinion of eating breakfast foods for dinner <laughs> I'm all for it <laughs> I'm all for it <laughs> oh. well this is a fucking waste of time here but <laughs> I'm all for it. You know, wasn't there uh there was that guy, the guy who convinced Americans that uh, uh women to start smoking 
what was his name? The, the famous uh, evil scientist, the psychiatrist. Um, you know, you don't talk about, right? Oh, oh, he was a uh, he, he was he was like, he was like a, a, a evil genius. Um, Torches for freedom. Uh, there it is. Ber Bernays. Bernays. Remember? Um, while men could smoke cigarettes, women couldn't. And he called them, he called them torches, freedom torches. And he says, I bet you I can get women smoking. And, uh, because the cigarette companies came to him like back in like the thirties or twenties or whatever it was. Uh, Edward Bernays is what his name was. Anyway, he also did a, I, I believe a, a project where he said he could have, he wanted to prove a point. He could have Americans eating bacon, um, for breakfast every single day. Cause back in the day, you, you had, you know, smoked pork belly. Cause that's how you preserve people ate it for dinner, lunch and everything. And, uh, he was so successful with his propaganda campaign that people started serving bacon for breakfast, it became a breakfast food. Before that, it was just bacon. So bacon, you, bacon is universal. It should be. Yeah, it yeah. is universal. And, uh, but I'm telling you right now, eating, uh, like eggs for dinner. That's, that's just dumb. That's just dumb. Shouldn't be done. <laughs> You don't like eggs for dinner? No, no. Oh, that's that's eggs. No, it's called a breakfast food, man. Yeah. <laughs> eggs are a breakfast food. Can't mess with it. Uh, here's right here. Bernays used his uncle Sigmund Freud. Oh, yeah. Okay. He was the nephew of, of Sigmund Freud. Ideas to help convince public, among other things, that bacon and eggs was the true all-American breakfast. Exactly. It is a breakfast food. Do not succumb to the to the the uh, the programming, sir. <laughs> Re reject the propaganda <sighs> you're terrible you, I, I you know what i hope happens i hope you trip and your beard gets caught <laughs> in 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 like a a doorknob and, and a little chunk rips out <laughs> that's horrible that's, that's horrible. That, uh, yeah i i wish that upon <laughs> thee now yes a curse has been placed upon thee what is your aggression against breakfast foods for for dinner what 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 happened to you when you were a child? Nothing. Not you know. Actually, you know what happened? My father. This there it is. is true there it story. Is. Here there it comes. It uh, Chris Mack in the chat room. Breakfast burrito for dinner. That's terrible, Chris Mack. Terrible. <laughs> Should wash your mouth out with soap for talking like that. No, my my father. Believe it or not, ran a, uh, an egg plant. Okay? okay. So you know, grating eggs before they went out to market. And to the stores. And I saw so many goddamn eggs as a kid. I oh. never want to see eggs again. Ever. Oh. Yeah. Uh, gotcha. Let's see here. Uh, let's see. Ruth Ann, the gorgeous and talented Ruth Ann, says, a chunk out of Corey's beard? Ha ha. Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> Hi, Christy Belly. You're looking lovely tonight. Laura Tarnowski, you're looking stellar as well. And uh, lovely Larry, good to see you. Mama Susan, thanks for coming on in. And uh, Cable Guy Matt's here. Remember, people. We got 45 seconds. Uh, we got about uh, a minute and a half. Be right back. All right. Remember, people, that if you buy a T-shirt from our store, actually, I'm going to change that. But if you hit up co uh, Cable Guy Matt, who's in the chat room, you can get your free piece of autograph, coaxial cable, Autographed by Cable Guy Matt. Limit one per household. Remember, folks, you cannot buy these in stores. So hit them on up. There are a limited supply. You know, there's only about 40,000 to go. 40,000. Thank you mm, for agreeing with me. And uh, I agree with you. Uh, let's see here. Hey, uh, bonjour, Julien. Comment ça va? <clears throat> There we go. All right. We got 25 seconds. Back. Oh, Cable Guy, Matt, you got to do this. You got to do this. A uh, big thank you to Cat Chaser and John Hires for the amazing super chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this. I see a lot of new faces in our chat room. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. We are live every night at 9 p.m. Pacific. Here we go with the second half hour. Second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is now underway. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much.
for joining us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. We want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davy the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight from the Phoenix Enigma. We have Corey Daniel on the show tonight. We're about to get into a deep discussion about artificial intelligence. Is it good for humans? Is it good for our future? Or are we creating our own movie of the Terminator? Here we go. Corey, how are you, man? Good, partner. Good. All right. Let's get down to it. AI, good for humanity? bad for humanity you know my personal philosophy as someone who grows food and uh, studied botany and uh, primitive survival and primitive uh, hiker is um, the more humans do the better it is in general um, you know my, my my granddaddy said when when he was a kid uh, he drank a lot of whiskey he drank a lot of whiskey he said you can drink as much you want just you gotta go out there and sweat every day make sure you sweat every day son he was a carpenter he's a master carpenter and he worked even his days off he worked he sweat every single day and whereas that's pretty rudimentary and simple philosophy um he lived to be old he was a whiskey drinking cigarette smoking man and um lived through a war and a half and um you know that that philosophy um i kind of subscribe to uh, spirituality is next to observation. Observation happens from interacting with your environment. People who garden, people who farm, people who know the land, people, uh, those people look up and those people look up, not at the phone all day. The more you do as a human, the more life you're going to live. You want to interact with the world. You don't want to succumb to it. Um, so no, I am, um, I'm for unplugging as much as humanly possible. Um, you know, but I don't, can we, I don't know. You know, there's, there's larger questions. This is a, um, you know, AI, am I for it against it? I mean, do we have a choice? Are we in charge? Are we in control? I mean, uh, I don't talk about aliens or extraterrestrials too often. Um, tell you what, I talk about extraterrestrials mostly on my show when I get into native American studies, because, um, you won't find, um, you will not find a tribe that does not believe in extraterrestrials and that we, we were, we were, we were seated here from them. If that's the case, if we were seated, um, you know, if they are our gods, if, if, if we were made in their image, um, you know, maybe there's a plan and maybe they needed humans at a certain rate. And then to get, you know, through, uh, the agrarian, uh, portion of, 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 of our development of the herd management and then into the industrial rev revolution. And then once that came into the computer revolution and maybe the next, you know, the next uh, system coming up is going to be a, 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 I, maybe the goal was to be here the whole time. Um, and I don't know how much, um, uh, you know, say, so we really have in it. I mean, look at, look at how you vote. Look at how I vote. Look at, um, this last, <laughs> look at the, uh, last elections, you know, um, we doesn't seem to matter what you believe and say anymore because things are just steamrolling through. And, um, you know, from the Bilderberger groups who, you know, th that, by the way, that used to be a conspiracy, right? Oh, the Bilderbergers are planning the future of the world. Oh my God. And it's like, oh no, now they put out their list and their agenda and their members every year. We have something here in Arizona called the Sedona forum where these NGOs get together and plan the next year worth of, um, policy, uh, and what, and what, what, what senators are going to talk to and, 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 and what, uh, programs are going to go on and stuff like that. And it's almost like it's all controlled and the AI is being slipped in, um, you know, uh, didn't we, there wasn't, wasn't there a Google thing yesterday that uh, Google now has a, a new patch in the app and it's talking about um, uh, making politically correct auto corrects. Did you hear that? Did you read that? I, that? I did not hear that one. I've been way too involved with all of the UFO stuff that's going on. Oh, which is everywhere too. Yeah. It's, it's all coming at once. We're, we're being blitzkrieged with technology, with infra information, with new systems. Um, you know, here in America, because of the COVID thing, right? 60% of all small business crashed and failed. While simultaneously, all the manufacturing, distribution, and retail got consolidated down to a few companies, Walmart, Target, Am Am Amazon, and all that, right? Um, this is, this is the, the old definition of fascism before fascism uh, began to mean violence. Uh, I want to ask you, if you don't mind, yeah. uh, uh, in regards to AI, when I hear somebody like Elon Musk talk mm -hmm. where 
they want to use AI to help reconstruct, you know, spinal cords or brain injuries or Alzheimer's in order to help people out. I, this is where I kind of get pulled in the middle of everything because, you know, I think we all know somebody who has suffered from paralysis or, or, you know, now, I mean, everywhere there seems to be autism in children or, or dementia or Alzheimer's in, in elderly and such a horrible, horrible set of diseases there for, for people. And this is where I kind of wonder, you know, I don't like AI. I think we're going too much. I really do. Okay. I don't like the fact that my son isn't, you know, and this is partially my fault as a parent, but my son has learned so much off of his iPad through apps and, you know, his spelling, his numbers, his vocabulary, his love of dinosaurs and sharks, you know, from watching YouTube videos, you know, rather than reading it in a book. I, I that bothers me. And partially that's my fault as a parent. But, I see the benefits that technology can have, especially when it comes to health. You know, we've we've sunk billions into cancer research over the last, you know, 40 years. And still, we, we don't have a lot of cures for that horrendous disease that my mother has survived twice. And this is my conundrum. I don't want to see, you know, people end up like uh, George Orwell's 1984 book, but I would like to see people end up, you know, if they're if they're paralyzed from from Afghanistan or a car accident and they have a chance to walk again, I would love to see that. So yeah. this is my conundrum as a human trying to figure out is AI good or bad? Where where should I draw the line? Well, we we had a conversation in the last segment about emotional thinking, didn't we? Understandable. They, yeah. And uh, that's the emotional ploy right there. Um, you know, one of the seven hermetic laws is the law of polarity, uh, when you get into the occult and occulted knowledge and the polarity is it's going to be for every good, there's, there's a, a, a bad, you know, male energy, men, for instance, build things and construct and, or the creativity and on and on. But the, the bad side of men is destruction, you know, and, uh, violence and psychopathy. Um, everything has a dual edge on it. And, um, this technology is absolutely one, one, one of them. Um, the AI right now will be, it has been weaponized against us for the consolidation of, in, of inf information. We're all on lists. Every one of us, you know, a, we, we, we joke down here. Oh, you're on a government list. You're all on a list. Every one of you out there listening to me, you're on a list as to what you consume, where you go, your, 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 your Google tracker in this, um, in your, in your, your scrying mirror here. Right. And, then, and that's what this is. This is, this is a scrying mirror. Um, it's all there. It captures everything, and uh, from the from the 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 targeted ads to the targeted campaign ads, um, it doesn't stop. And one day we won't we won't be voting. One day I'm convinced of that, and we're not far from that day. I I, I don't b believe, but the AI is here, and it is so integrated with us. Um, from and, and not just the scary things about robots, but food distribution algorithms on the computer, um, the switches, uh, uh, the servers that turn on and off your like. Electricity and the pumps for the for the for the for the the uh, the water um, that we all use. All of it. It's all AI driven today. Um, so it's already inter inter integrated. This uh, what's that new computing? Uh, the uh, um, uh, not stellar computing. What what do they, what do they call it? The um, I'll think of it in a second. But uh, they don't even know where it's coming from. The answers come back from the other side in this uh, super com computer. And uh, they just don't, they have no clue, you know, um, automation, you know, automation means less jobs. And what do we have right now? If you're watching the news in America, nobody wants to work, right? Nobody wants to work. There are jobs. I could go have 20 jobs to today if I wanted to. No one wants to, to work. This is going to spur, um, and I, I believe this by d design. I am a conspiracy analyst. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a conspiracy an analyst, but I see the trends coming. And this is AI driven as well. And the economy crashed. Nobody wants to work. Stimulus is coming in. And what happens? This is going to be the perfect push for uh, grocery stores and big corporations who, and there's only a few left that move all of our food and products in America to go completely robotic. And then what happens? They scale down or up as they need to. Um, privacy. Privacy is a big one. 
right? Um, you're in tech. I'm in tech. We're in, um, we're in the distribution of, inf of in information and I ideas. Um, I could, we, we could do 10 shows on the violation of privacy due to AI and algorithms. Um, you know, I mean, I've been on my first two strikes before the third one on, well, both YouTube and <laughs> when I was in Facebook prison, um, it was AI. It wasn't a person down there. It was AI. Right. And, um, you talk about, I'll tell you what terrifies me are drones. We're having congressional hearing. We had them last year. Uh, they have these drones that'll go out there and they'll sit on like a mountainside or above a town and the AI in them. Um, is programmed to where if a guy walks up and what looks like a, 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 a rifle, the drone will open up and drop smaller drones out of it and they'll go in and take out the threat. Um, the big congressional hearing last year on this was, do we at this point make these drones autonomous or still require the decision from a human being? And due mm. to the G Geneva con convention, they had to have a person actually pushing the button and reviewing it. And, and, I'm like, wow, this, this reads just like a Facebook, um, 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 uh, review only it's going to be for, for like warfare now. And this is what's really out there. What happens when toll booths and cops say, you know, uh, there was an article last year, uh, sorry, uh, last month I, I read on, on one of our, our broadcasts, the police departments are using drones going up and down city, city streets, utilizing AI algorithms for people. Uh, looking suspicious or breaking into cars or walking when they shouldn't be or stopping because they've they've done studies and tests. They know what how fast people should be walking and uh, they will then dispatch cops over to there. Um, I want to get I want I, I want to get to a couple of points here. And Stephanie brings up a point because I think all of us have had this happen, even though social media places like Mark Zuckerberg and and Jack Dempsey from Twitter have denied this is happening. But this is one that bugs me, all right? I'm sitting in front of my computer. I th I'm thinking, I'm craving a bag of chips. I go upstairs, I grab a bag of chips out of my cupboard. I bring it down to the computer. My phone is sitting there in dark mode. I go on Facebook. I'm eating my chips. I go on Facebook and all of a sudden, my first three ads are Miss Vicky's chips, the chips that I brought from downstairs. Did not say, mm, I'm craving Miss Vicky's chips. Couldn't hear me. How did it tap into my brain? Or is there something in the packaging that is setting it off? I don't think it's the packaging. I think it's your cameras. Your cameras are always on. The cameras, whether it's on or off, are always on. Um, your, your audio is always on. I mean, how do you think Siri knows that you're saying, Siri? Siri's on. It's listening to you. So when you say Siri, you're not turning Siri on then, then saying Siri. Siri's on listening to you. It's that little box you clicked at the bottom that says accept all terms. Um, and it's the deals on the back end that uh, Zuckerberg has with, um, you know, all the other companies and AI and government uh, and NSA and feeding him in, in, info and intel and everything else that's going into these huge um, fusion centers or being sold out. Um, I'll tell you what's even creepier. Um, Alicia and her friends uh, do these um, studies every once in a while for remote viewing. And she has a, 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 a gaggle of friends that she, uh, she she does this with. And they will think to themselves something at a certain time. And um, and they'll write it down into an, in this envelope. And um, it'll see how long it takes for their phones to start just only thinking it. And I don't know. Um, I know that this phone right now has all the technology in it that it needs to read your 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 bio bio rhythms and your heartbeat and your stress levels and there are there's ai in here that senses your stress on the phone when you're talking right now it's on it's on every single moment and um all that goes into and maybe maybe last night you walked down and got chips a certain night or maybe three nights out of the week uh you had your phone with you one time and it recorded the sound of the chips and it knew that three times a week you down go 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 downstairs and get chips, uh, just like it knows that um, you know x amount of uh, men between the ages of forty and fifty are going to go out and buy a sports car, um, you know, at a certain time of day. You know, it's all algorithms. It's just, it's just numbers. We're very predictable creatures, human beings. Okay, the other one that I'm that I'm kind of concerned with is we've recently seen McDonald's looking into robotic chefs instead of hiring people. We've seen now uh, Domino's, or is it Domino's with the Noid? Avoid the Noid on their on their advertisement that they are now using robot vehicles to deliver 
pizzas to people. I haven't seen that yet. Wow. Yes. They're doing that in the States. And, and I'll tell you why it bugs me. Mc, places like McDonald's or, or the pizzas joint who needs delivery. That's usually an entry level job for a high school kid or a college kid who is looking to make a few bucks, put some gas in their tank, maybe take the girlfriend or boyfriend out for a, a dinner one night on a weekend or, or to buy mom and dad, a you know, supper one night, or just to, you know, help pay for some college or some tuition or books or whatever it may be. And those low end jobs, those beginner jobs are starting to be eliminated by technology and AI. This is where, and robots, this is where I get scared for the future. I mean, you know, I look at, I look at my children, both trying to get ahead in the world. They're both, one's graduating, one's in college. And, you know, they're both trying to, to work their way through this. But the fact is they can't because everything is competition. You now, uh, you know, I mean, in Las Vegas right now, if you choose Las Vegas, the way the city is going for every one job opening, there's like 1500 applicants because people are starved to, to get back to work and get that city going. I mean, where does it stop? You know, can it stop when, when a pizza joint like Domino's is using robot vehicles instead of teaching young kids what it's like to earn a buck? It's, um, well, it's not going to, and it's not going to because they have other plans for your, for your, your, your children. That's, that's, that's the answer. Um, they want new legislation right now to get your kids at a, at a younger age, um, um, from, 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 from kindergarten earlier. It started, you know, uh, you know, Clinton, it takes a village, right? Um, we're diminishing people. We're diminishing, uh, men in the world, especially. And when men, um, uh, aren't going out there grabbing families, there's nothing to defend. So you're not out there, um, defending anything, so having, having, fa having families and where do people go? Where do women go when they, and this is not misogynist, but the numbers, they will go to government um, when they need when they need 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 help and the government is going to be there as families disintegrate and they have plans for children um there is something coming there is something on the precipice here that is we're almost there and we're being herded into it we're being downsized we're being changed um i mean look at I mean, let's just i'm not it's something going to go, go off but believe me i will i'll it, it'll come full full circle here um it, they said between 60 and 80 percent of people are not going to be going back into the workplace. They're, they're just not going to do it um, because the and I, I called this at the beginning of the COVID thing because uh, they're going to realize it's cheaper to give people a laptop computer and not have the overhead of a big building and all the things that they go with that. And they can just cycle people through as they need them. They can upsize and down and, and downsize. Um, apartments are going everywhere right now in, 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 in the States can be, and home ownership is down while apartments are, are, are up. They said, you're going to own nothing and you're going to love it. We are fundamentally being changed. Uh, the gov government that used to laugh at cryptocurrency is now looking at that saying, oh, we have our own cryptocurrency coming out, right? It's going to be the federal digital dollar, I believe, or something to that effect. They're, they're calling it. And I'm not a crypto guy. I just work on the per periphery of it. I, I have friends that are really into it. Um, we are being changed at a rate right now, um, that is unprecedented and, you know, the tech in, in the industry is reflective of that. It's, 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 it's just a symptom of a, of a bigger problem. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier, even, um, people want it in a lot of ways and it's not all going to be bad. You know, you, you said cancer, right? Uh, people have cancer and it, it's horrible. It's tragic, you know? Uh, there's reasons why we have cancer. Uh, people didn't used to get cancer at the rate that they do now. We didn't live as long, but uh, they took the good stuff out. They, they, they feed us dead food. Um, but, you know, with these vaccines they got coming out, it's an mRNA technology. And uh, remember last year when Trump came out and said, we're going to have a cure for cancer within 10 years. And he also said, we're going to have a cure for HIV. Do you remember him, him saying that? Yes. I, I, I watched it live and my jaw hit the table. I'm like, what? And I, this was, this was before it's about three or four months prior to, um, the COVID thing breaking out. And I thought, what is he talking about? And then, uh, T cells came out the next day and that kind of grabbed the narrative and pulled it this way for a while. Um, and then as we learn more about the vaccine, we, we learn it's an MRNA scripter. It's not a vaccine. And, um, you can, you can program it to program your DNA to produce other things. 
And that's exactly the technology that, that, that he was talking. If that's true, that would be amazing. That would be amazing. This could be the, the cure to cure everything, you know, kind of like in um, the Isaac Asimov's childhood then where the, where the extraterrestrials came down and they cured all disease within one generation. This is it. If, if, if this is it, this is it. Um, and that, and that would be a good thing, but what's the cost of that? You know, uh, we live in a, we, we live in a three dimensional world for, if you include time and I do, um, but it's called the three di dimensional world and we're governed by entr by entropy. Um, you know, time is the measurement of the decay of matter and everything degrades in this world. It goes into entropy and that's part of the beauty of the human experience. Um, you know, the uncertainty, you know, back in the day when, when, when you and I were, were kids, baseball, right? I used to go to the games here, um, in Phoenix and you didn't know all the stats of because they weren't compiled. Nowadays, you can look at the beginning of the season and tell who's going to be there at the very end minus any accidents, right? They know who's going to do what every year. It's a science. They know who to put up to bat against what pitcher. They know exactly how to run it like a machine. And everything is so honed down now. It's terrifying. All the fun and joy is taken out. Um, well, oh, what's tell me about it. Tell me about it. You know, I can't, dude, I grew up on NHL hockey being in Canada. Go figure. Mm -hmm. Can't even watch the game anymore. Mm -hmm. Can't even watch it. You know, it's, it's too fast. It's too big. It's, it, you know, it's taken away the hitting, uh, you know, hockey's a very physical sport and they've taken the physicality should uh, be uh, out of it. It should know? be. It's men doing men things. Let men go be men in a, in arena and, and throw pucks at each other and high stick and whatever. By you know, God, that's, 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 that's what we want. Right. You know, like <laughs> our local junior hockey team here plays in a league where they used to play with what they call a visor visor comes right across to protect the eyes. Got no problem with that. But last year, before uh, the season was shut down for COVID, they voted on putting in a full cage mask. It's not hockey. <laughs> it's not <laughs> hockey. And what these idiots don't understand is the more gear and the stronger the players get, the dirtier the game gets. It doesn't get better. It gets dirtier because there's yeah. protection there. But I could go off on that. That's just that's same with, same's true in like warfare, you know? What happens when this all goes into relationships? Some of the most beautiful, gorgeous mistakes of my life have been in relationships, you know? Choosing the wrong person and then <laughs> living through it and having that life experience and then walking away saying, you know, coming back and meeting her a few years later and saying, you know what? God, it was tragic, but you know, it, it was a time and you you grow. What happens when you're when you have all the apps on here as to who to, to, to choose and you're, you're designated who your mate is to, to program. We're not that far away from that, man. That sounds crazy right now, but you take the uncertainty, you take the gamble, you take the entropy and the pain out of life. And you, you just boil people down to these cogs in a machine. And the question is, why are we going that direction? What is that machine? What does it look like? And who is running the darn thing? And where's it going? It's going into the singularity. And on that note, I'm going to get you to hold on right there, Corey, if you don't mind, because we are going to go to break here at the top of the hour. Great discussion about what's going on in the world with the Phoenix Enigma. Corey Daniel here tonight on Spaced Out Radio. We are having a great conversation. We're just discussing AI. We'll see where it goes. This is unscripted. This is where we just go down the rabbit hole and bring up all those things that just maybe, maybe you're questioning too. We'll be back with more Corey Daniel on Spaced Out Radio right after this. All right, we are clear. So I'm just going to step away and I'll be right back here so you can uh, just uh, take a little break here for a couple of minutes, okay? Cool, man. All right. Be right back, people.
All right, I am back. And let's get you back in here. There you are. All right, we are about a minute away. Check, check, check. Hi, Stella for Star. Welcome to our chat room. And we got 144 people watching right now. Stetson John, and uh, welcome. Shark Belly Kelly, welcome to our chat room. Thank you for joining us. Shark Belly. And uh, who else we got here? Oh, let's see here. Um, KD, welcome to our chat room. Thank you. as Corey drops a bunch of stuff on his shelves. And big thank you to all of our new subscribers and people tuning in for the first time. I just want to remind you guys, we are a live radio show, which is why we are uh, on a commercial break. And uh, a good way to support this show on our YouTube channel is hit that subscribe button, ring that bell. We're live seven days a week at 9 p.m. Pacific. Thank you to our super chatters, both John and Cat Chaser. It's a great way to support uh, our show. And oob to Joe's main, you've got aliens. Here we go, everyone. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook, Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. Thank you so much to our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live. Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. What do you got for us, Clam? Panto Pragmatic. Panto Pragmatic is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with the Phoenix Enigma. Corey Daniel is our guest tonight. And Corey, one of the topics I want to get to, I, I know you're you're not really too heavy into the whole ET UFO thing, but this is something that is a big story going on in the world right now, especially in the United States, where we seem to be getting closer to understanding that there are potential visitors from other planets coming here. It's all over the mainstream media. I don't like the way it's been covered. I think that the mainstream media was caught with their pants down on this subject for experiences that have been happening for centuries with people. So I'm curious to you, and I've asked a number of guests this along the way, is why now? Why all of a sudden is UFOs an important subject? Well, it's everything we've been talking about, I, I believe, uh, from the AI to the um, the reformation of the, you know, you've heard the term glo the global reset? Yes. Well, we're being reset. Um, we're being reset economically. We're being reset politically. We're being reset by different norms. The Overton window of normalcy, the new normal, <laughs> all of it. Um, your dog doesn't like that either. No, she doesn't. Um, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry. We, do we yeah. like dogs. We're dog friendly here. Um, the, uh, it, it's, I, I, I don't think there's anything acts there. In my opinion, when it comes to mainstream media, there is nothing accidental about it. Period. All of it is contrived. All of it is propaganda. All of it is deployed in a systematic tech, uh, technocracy way to, uh, to best disseminate the information needed to move the herd at any given time. I don't believe that the media has, uh, much of a say so as to what they do, uh, and what they, they cover it. And it wouldn't take a grand conspiracy either. You'd only need the editors or, or the editor in chief at every, um, uh, radio or new or, you know, clear channel, let's say, right. Or at, um, Fox or, or whoever the parent company is to dictate 
uh, what stories go forward and what don't, or which ones get paid for and which ones don't. Same thing for academia. You don't need a great conspiracy and you don't need to, to, to control millions of academics. You just make a, a system that rewards the type of academic results that you want for a political narrative or objective. And you reward those people, be it global warming, right? I mean, do you think governments are paying any money for people coming up with anti-global warming stuff? No. No. Do you think you're going to move up in ac 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 academia if you're saying, wait a minute, hold on a minute. We, we added X amount of feet or, you know, miles of ice this year. No, they're only going to pay for the stuff they want. Um, if you listen to the, 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 the Sedona forum that I talked about earlier, they were talking about this exact thing. They had to fund the research and get the results so they could take that to the lawmakers. Um, it's by design. The experts say, the experts say, the experts say. Um, well, and then the, the media comes out and reports what the experts say. They bought that, they they bought those results and they're deployed at specific times and the narrative is pushed. This is um, this has been happening for a while. Dis, dis, disclo disclosure's been going on. But uh, remember again, I mentioned earlier, Childhood's End. Did you ever see that movie or read the book? No, I have not. Aliens come to Earth and they park these big, huge motherships above like every major, major city across the entire world. And they don't come out and they're communicating with 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 humans and they're giving humans all this technology and all this good stuff. And they're waiting till everybody who was alive on Earth has passed away. And only those who were born with those ships above their cities and and only know the generosity and the goodness of these people. They're waiting for all of them to grow up before they come down and reveal them th th themselves. And that's exactly where we're at. Um, control happens. And although I, I, I do think they've been pushed a little bit because otherwise it'd be more of a gradual change, but we are, um, there's a disclosure happening and it has been happening for uh, several decades now. And um, I think this is uh, testing the waters here. They're, they're, they're stress testing our opinions as to uh, how we're going to take it, um, it's in, in 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 my opinion, it's no coincidence that Israel and Palestine have fired up again as well in the middle of this alien disclosure thing, uh, because when you get into, you know, this book, um, you know, the Bible or any of that religion, it ties into a lot of earth changing, earth ending, earth, you know, um, narratives. Um, to me, it's not a coincidence. All right. You know, my big thing is this, you know, I, as a me former member of the mainstream media, the, I'm, I'm very disappointed with the way that it is gone. I, I really am. You know, we've gone from actual reporting and being the police, the judge and the jury for, for the public to being a clickbait outlet, the I'm offended outlet. And I'm, and I'm not a fan of that type of journalism. I, I, I don't think it's correct. I know it's not being taught in schools. I know a lot of, of journalism instructors who I've talked to personally about this who say, look, Dave, we're not teaching it this way. We're teaching, call it down the middle. And, but it's the corporations out there that are force feeding these journalists to, to call it the way that they want to see it. Journalism is not supposed to be uh, partisan, yet we're seeing par partisan outlets. Doesn't matter what side of the ledger you're on. And so I, I do find it disgusting. And I, and I think it's, it's a real mockery of a great career where the public is supposed to get proper information. Now, that being said, when it comes to the entire UFO phenomena and the narrative that seems to be behind it, I mean, we keep hearing about this threat narrative that is going on, yet from what we can see so far, there has been no threats that have been made. So is this about trying to get taxpayers' money for this research, or is it about trying to keep people in fear? It ain't about the money. It's never about the money. And if, if I can put anything to, you, to, to your listeners tonight, it's never, ever, ever about the money. Money is a tool. And you get to a certain level in this world where you've ha you have everything you've ever wanted, right? You had all the greatest food, all the greatest wine, all the greatest properties. It's not about the money. The money is printed. Money is going digital, right? And um, it is, right? but it's never about the money. The money is a way to, you throw capital at something to make something move. Um, 
it's about moving the herd. It's about getting this human species where it needs to be for this next reset, for this next global reset. Um, but it, I, I don't, I, I've never believed it's about the money and it's, it's easy thing to do because when you, when you get into class warfare, right. And people are tribal, just generally, we were, we, we, we think tribally, we think locally, we think in terms of family, right. And then, and then, and then, and then clan and then town and then County and then state or province, you know, and, 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 and then country. And we have different levels of tribalism. And one of them is within our class and class warfare is an excellent way to motivate and control people um, and say they got more than you and taxation and all that. But um, when you can print money at will, when you are the governments, um, when you're Bill Gates, when you're Soros, when you can throw a hundred billion dollars at a cause um, and they call it philanthropy, right? Phil I mean, beware that word. If you ever see philanthropy, you know, you're in trouble. Okay. Um, <laughs> philanthropy ain't what it used to be. <laughs> philanthropy did, did, didn't Bill Gates said last month he wanted to blot out the sun. He came out and said, "I said uh, I'm going to blot out the sun, you know, uh, for global warming." Uh, that doesn't sound good. That just doesn't sound good. Um, yeah, I mean, where 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 do you want me to go on that? I mean, it's uh, it's never about the money, man. Well, let me, let me ask you this: Do you think there are aliens up there wanting to come to Earth or have been to Earth already? I think they're here. I think they've been here. When you look at the oldest, um, the oldest documents, it'd be the Indian Vedics. Okay. They talk about these huge cities floating down. And then they talk about these men are coming out and fighting each other. in the, in the, these, these wars, you have, uh, the God, uh, Hanuman, he's half monkey, half human. Right. And he, 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 all these stories, these great deeds, you have the, uh, the Greek with their, their mythos, right? Um, the minotaurs and all this stuff. Do you know what the word mythos means? No, it means the truths, the truths. That was the truths of their creation. Nowadays, like everything else, it's upside down. So myth means fiction back in the day, myth or mythos meant the origins or the, the truth. Everything today is upside down. Uh, you get into Ireland and you talk about the little people, you know, um, you, you know, we all had read stories of the little people um, and the giants growing up, right? That's been re relegated to mythos and to legends. But I'll tell you what, every single last one of my Native American friends, people who I've in interviewed have talked about the giants. The uh, Apaches call them the the, uh, the Gwindipids. Um, all of them have stories of these little people. Um, I, I, I talked to uh, a man on the Yavapai Res, not far from, from Phoenix here, out where I used to work. And he told me stories for hours about the little people out, out there. I think they've been here, man. I think they have um, for a long time. And I don't think they came from far, far away. Um, I think at this point, they're probably interdimensional, if anything. And I'll tell you why. Because my grandfather never entertained the idea of extraterrestrials. It just wasn't something, you know, he was born on a, on a farm in upstate New York and stole chickens and coal to make it through the winter. You know, they never had this kind of exposure to these ideas and thoughts or extraterrestrials or whatnot. My, my mother born here in Phoenix, um, you know, her idea and concept of aliens and extraterrestrials was from the black and white movies, right? They came from Mars. They came from Venus, right? And they came here to do war because, well, it was a wartime and uh, men had about 50%, 75% more testosterone in this country back in the 1950s than we currently do today due to GMOs and the poisoning of our food supply. Um, so everything was, 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 you know, survival oriented. And then we get into the nineties and the science and I'm born with a little gray, that little, the little guy right be, be, behind you there, right? Is that a, is that an alien gray there on your Looks painting? Like you. Yeah. And, right there. Um, that, or right there. That's Carl. Yeah, that's Carl. Carl. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, it was the alien grays for us. And then, you know, super string theory comes along and it's like, well, you know, we now have you know, warp drives and they could have come from Alpha Centauri. Right. And as as our knowledge of technology blooms and I, I don't say as we grow in technology, as the technology is disseminated to us, as we are being slowly desensitized as a human species, I think we've had this stuff for a long time. Uh, CERN, I can discern in just a minute for you. I'm no CERN expert, but I know enough about it to know that, uh, well, it's, it's an old plan. It's an old plan. It's not a brand new thing. Nowadays with what we know, we think, you know what? They're probably interdimensional. They're, they're, they probably are. So just in three generations, you know, how the idea and concept of extraterrestrials and, or in life 
has changed. And I find that staggering. Um, I find that the hockey stick of transportation, you ever heard of that? I'm or, sorry. You, you broke up in my headphones. Oh, the hockey stick of, of, of a transportation, you know, for 200,000 years, humans are walking around earth on, and they're walking around and they're running and they're walking. And about 5,000, 7,000 years ago, someone catches a horse and they break it and they start riding it and life gets better. Then they hook a cart up to it and they say, oh, well, we're going to make the cart a uh, horse and we start trading and life gets better because we're trading and farming agriculture and all that good stuff. Right. In the 1880s, someone invents internal combustion engine, puts it into that cart and we got a car and life's getting better. You know, 10 years later, they put wings on that car and the thing's flying. 71 years later, we're on the moon, allegedly. Okay. So that, 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 that hockey stick graph looks like this. It's going for 200,000 years and it just goes straight up. It just goes straight up. And then in 1969, it just goes, it, it flattens back out again. And from 69 to 2021, nothing solid rocket fuel, nothing. If anybody believes that we've had no new technological advances since solid rocket fuel leaving earth's atmosphere, I got a bridge to sell you. Um, Technology is more than certainly disseminated and deployed in relation to the herd management of the human species as we are being molded. So do you believe then that there is a secret space program? Absolutely. How do you know that? I just, I, I, I just believe, I believe that, um, there's been rumblings about it. Who is that guy up there, uh, in Canada? Um, your uh, former defense minister. Paul Hillier. Yeah. Yeah. What he had to say about it, you know? Um, there's been a lot of people whistleblowing and talking about this for a lot of years. Uh, you had, um, oh, well, the U S astronauts, they've all talked about it. Um, Buzz Aldrin was the one who <laughs> said, wait till people get, get, get a load of the monoliths on the moon surrounding Saturn. They've all talked about things flying out there. I mean, they, they have told us, they have told us about this. Um, but for some reason, Humans believe that unless it comes from your government in an official capacity and it's got the seal on it and the stamp and the signature, it's not real. It is. I'm telling you, it is real. So do you believe then the moon landings were fake? Um, I believe that that project was absolutely fake. Um, I believe that uh, they, we were in a race with the Russians and, um, and that they faked all that. It's, it's obvious. I mean, there's no way that thing's made out of tinfoil and, and shower curtain rods. I mean, come on. It just, uh, it just looks so bad. And, you know, to hear them talk and, you know, you, it's like a four mil, four mils thick going through space and a piece of space dust hits it. It would have exploded and it's going at how many thousands of miles an hour and surviving the, no, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Getting, getting through, through the Van Allen belt. I think if we did go there, uh, we probably had other technology to get us there. Um, Antarctica interests me quite a bit. It always has. Um, remember when um, the inauguration of Trump? Remember who was down in Antarctica that day? John Kerry went down there. I believe one of the popes and a, a head cardinal down there. There were all these foreign dignitaries going down to Antarctica during the, uh, I believe it was the inauguration, Trump's first inauguration. The only inauguration. But um that was, con that was concerning. That was inter 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 interesting that on that of all days, they'd be going down there. Or was it, was it election, was election day? What? Okay. So what about, what about the, the rumors that are coming out of NASA? And I've talked to a couple of people about this with Neil Armstrong going on the, on the emergency line saying they are here, they are on the Hill and they are watching us. Yeah. I've seen those. I've, I've seen those. the question is, did it happen or was it, was it, um, um, uh, engineered? Was it de was it was it desensitization? Was it propaganda? You know, um, are they telling us bit by bit and then just running it out, playing a, 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 a game of it? Well, it's easy to question fifty years later. Did you see the interview where they all came back? They all came back and sat there. It was that black and white interview? I think it was, and they're all sitting there at the table, looking like they just lost a ball game. The the dudes allegedly just came back from the moon, right? The greatest achievement in the history of the human species and they come back and they sit down all sullen and defeated like they were just told what to, to say it was the weirdest interview ever um and that made me think that's kind of weird why are they all sullen and kind of depressed looking and what's really going on here you know marcus know. allen a conspiracy theorist out of the united kingdom puts up a very very good argument that we did not go to the moon mm -hmm. but here, here's my conundrum. Dr. Edgar Mitchell, 
who had the late Dr. Edgar Mitchell, who was the sixth man to walk on the moon. He really kicked off the entire uh, basis for ET abduction and UFOs. He really pushed behind the scenes with politicians to start taking ETs and UFOs uh, very seriously and ET abduction to the point where he started a group called the Free Experiencers Project, where everyday people could, if they've been abducted by aliens, could go onto his website, the Free Experiencers, and take a, a test of whether or not they have been abducted or not. And plus, if you look in the background of, of a lot of these, um, of a lot of these studies that have been going on and reports that have come out about UFOs, his name is attached all to it because in the end there, he never admitted whether he did or not. I don't believe, but from what I know, he, I, I believe there is a rumor that he saw something while on his way to the moon or while on the moon. So I'm just curious, you know, somebody like that who was number six to walk on the moon is you know, through the rest of his life, being a a proponent of learning about ET experiencers. Interesting. Very interesting. I'm not familiar with all of his of his his work and what he's he's done, but but given what you said, yeah, I mean, how do you weigh that with all the other evidence of there uh, when you slow down, like the buggy? Why would you bring that that little buggy car when when they're sawing off the their 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 their, their toothbrushes for like weight and every single gram counts? Why are you going to bring a car? to the moon, that little buggy thing to get you out another 50 yards. It doesn't make any sense. You know, um, the heat, the radiation, um, how hot it would have been. Was it 200 and something degrees? And that they had a little air conditioning pack there batteries back in that day, right? It would have taken X amount of batteries to run that thing while they're up there. How did they run for so long? Um, there's the, uh, the, uh, time limit from how long it took when speaking into the microphone or into, into, into their, their comms to get down to earth. There's so many discrepancies that they, I don't think they thought about um, in the day. There's enough evidence to believe that we didn't go to the moon yet. You have Edgar Mitchell doing all that there. Um, I don't know. I'll tell you one of the most fascinating books I ever read. I've got it right back here. Um, oh, it's not handy, but it's um, um, who built the moon, who built the moon. And um, it's a great book. I think it's like Christensen, I believe his name was. Is two, uh, two, two, two gentlemen wrote it. And they go into all the reasons why the moon is probably artificial. And the size of the moon, the distance of the, the, the moon um, in relation to the sun, it's like one four hundredth the size of Earth, but Earth is 100, uh, the, the 140 the size of, of, of the sun. If it was any farther away, it, it, I mean, all the things that the moon includes, um, it has a very hard core with a soft, dusty exterior, so it can actually take hits from meteors um, from the rotation and what it allows Earth to do and spin in the seasons. Um, there are more reasons to believe the the moon is, is a manufactured object than it is to believe that it's real. And there's more reasons when you go through it to believe the Earth, moon should not be there than the fact that it's actually there. Um, I am so convinced by that book and other things I've read and heard over the years and watched that um, I believe that it's not unfathomable that this solar system may have, and I, I am not a flat earther, um, but the solar system may have been constructed. It may be a project. There may be the amount of technology and knowledge and energy out there to engineer solar systems to grow solar systems or, or galaxies, uh, even maybe who knows to, to grow and proliferate life. Um, I don't see why that's not possible. And the other, the other idea I toy around with consistently, and I've watched um, um, uh, dissertations and um, uh, scientists get together and talk about it at length, is the um, the uh, fact that uh, we could all be in a computer simulation. That is one that's going along, even with a lot of people who are looking into their own spirituality. Man, and that fits right in there with the Mandela effect. I've had so many Mandela effects. And uh, let, 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 let's go to Mandela when we come back okay. on the break, because I had a couple things recently happen that have really tripped me out. And I'll give them to you. And I want to get your opinion of them. Awesome. If you don't mind, the Phoenix Enigma, Corey Daniel here on Spaced Out Radio, his beard looking fantastic as ever. <laughs> yes. We like a good beard around here on Spaced Out Radio. 
We'll be back right after this. All right. There we go. We're clear. Okay. I never really believed in Mandela. Up until recently, I had a couple of things happen. Oh, I want to hear this. Save for when we're live, man. I want to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. I've had a few happen to me as well. Yeah. Christopher Knight, Who Built the Moon. Have you read that book? No. It's really worth reading. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, you could uh, give me most books, and I'm going to tell you no, because when I first, uh, right before I had my first ET contact, I was taken and asked not to read books. Seriously? Seriously. Interesting. Why? why? What was the reason? They, they, whoever they are, put me in a white room. I knew there was walls there, even though I couldn't see them. And this voice, very male, uh, told me that uh, they didn't want me doing research. They didn't want me reading books, watching television shows, anything on these subjects. Here's where it got weird. They said, but we allow, we give you permission to watch YouTube videos. And when I said, I don't understand, I'm trying to figure out what's going on with me and what I'm seeing. And if, if you're taking everything away from me and they said, the answer is simple. You'll be able to tell what is real and what is fake. That's interesting. And so if you look on my bookshelf right here, right there, and mm. even above that on the couple shelves, I got a bunch of books there that I've never, I've never read. Interesting. Cause, I, cause I've followed that to a T. I haven't even, I'm like five books behind on Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan series now. That pisses me <laughs> off. Well, hopefully someday it'll be on YouTube for you. Yeah. Sovereign yeah. farts. No, I've never had an MIB experience. I had something sort of like an MIB experience, but not, he wasn't in black. It was um, a very tall individual came up and looked kind of down at me. I seven, all of seven foot and just this presence that was not human. It was kind of lurchy. And at the same time, I just knew that I knew the dude was a human. I knew he was not human. It was in one of my gas stations, actually, back when we used to own gas stations. Very, very odd. Oh, I got stories about the desert. We, we didn't even get into, we didn't even get into the desert tonight. I know we, I'm trying, man, but it's, uh, the, the one thing that I do with these interviews, when I do them, I just let them naturally roll where they're going. Yeah. You true. know, and we usually end up losing a lot of good information and stories on that, but we try to bring them back. Okay. Yeah. You ever want me back on again? Just let me know. All right. Hi, gorgeous Michelle C. Good to see you back in the chat room. Uh, John, could you, uh, let us know about the Stetson you're wearing tonight? Mad Kiwi, where have you been hanging out? About time you get your ass back in the chat room. Could you give us a haka before the start of each show? We'd appreciate that. <laughs> I tell you, I, you, you ever go on YouTube and watch like, uh, the New Zealand all blacks haka? Yeah, it's pretty yeah. terrifying. That that is that is totally intense. If I was on that rugby field, I really don't know if I would play them. <laughs> That's what I really do. <laughs> I, I really don't know. I mean, not only are they tough, not only are they the best team in the world, but then they come at you with this haka that literally is there to make you crap your pants. That's intimidating. Now, now, do the other teams have the ability or the option to do their own haka or some do in, in, in intimidation? Um, some do ritual. There's a real good one between Tonga and the New Zealand All Blacks. I highly recommend anybody on YouTube pull that up. T uh, t Tonga and and New Zealand All Blacks. The hakas between the two teams. 
dude, that shit got real really fast, <laughs> really fast. Oh, that's funny. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Shit. Now I'm distracted. Where are we going next? Uh, what topic? Yeah, where, where, what were we just talking uh, Let's about? just keep rolling with um, uh, extraterrestrials, and I'll pull it into Arizona. All right, let's do it. All right, hold on here, buddy. Uh, thank you, Aiden, Jeremy, Cat Chaser, and John for the Super Chats. Really do appreciate it. Here we go. We pass the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. We want to say hello and thank you to everyone tuning us in tonight and remind you that all of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do old Davey the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with the Phoenix Enigma. Corey Daniel is our guest tonight, and we're having a great time. We're talking UFOs, aliens, and everything, Mandela effect. And uh, we wanted to get into that and just touch on that here for a little bit with you, Corey, if you don't mind. So I, I'm curious, uh, you're starting to believe that there might be something to this Mandela effect. Yeah, yeah, there absolutely is, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I, I had a, well, I was one of the people that actually watched Mandela uh, die on TV. I remember I was in school, I was in grade school, and they pulled a cart in with the TV before they had him in the actual rooms. And I remember it was a huge thing. They were talking about it and they were talking, Oh, Mandela. And I'm like, who's Mandela, you know? And then here, a few years later, he got out of jail and became president. I'm like, this is really bizarre. Um, when I started up my, my, um, uh, my YouTube show, I had this little intro, right? It was the early days. Right. And, and I, and I, I, um, my buddy built it for me, the little intro with the, I don't know, whatever software he used. He says, all right, what do you want to say? And I, and I said, um, uh, deoculting the American Southwest, right? I think is 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 what my little thing that came came a, a, across said on it. It was animated, and he's okay. Proofread this for me, and I proofread it. And he said, and I sent it back. He's and and he proofread it. He did it in it, and he went ahead and um, uh, built the whole thing. He rendered it. He sent it back to me. I used it, and I used it, and I used it. And about a month and a half later, someone said, "Hey, dude, like in your in your thing there, it says it doesn't say American. It says Amera CIA." A M E R C I A N as in CIA, like central intelligence Ag Ag agency, like it was, um, like it was, uh, uh, flipped. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I proofread that thing four times. My, my guy proofread it. He rendered it. I've been using it for several months now and now it's, and it never said that before. And I'm like, this is, I know for an absolute solid fact that we did not make that mistake on that. It was proofread by too many people. Um, you know, I think CERN probably has a lot to do with this. I mean, how big is CERN? CERN is the largest, the largest international, uh, the largest thing ever built, I believe on earth. Is it not? It spans the, the, the largest area. Is it 12 miles across or something? Or 11 miles, miles across. How many miles under underground does it go? It's, it's the largest joint international, um, uh, uh, project ever undertaken by humans. And we just now. Well, first of all, let me back up. How long would it have take, taken to have engineered that? How, I mean, and how long do you begin running plans before it goes like what, how many miles underground does it do? 20 miles or something? It's, it's, it's absolutely huge. And that we, you know, it, we, we, you would have had to have, they didn't have the materials to build this thing when they would have been drafting the plans to build it. This thing has to have been alien technology. It has to have been ancient technology that resurfaced and got built. I, I just don't see any, it doesn't because nothing else makes sense. The project is too massive in my opinion. Uh, and, and, and I'm just a layman here. This is just common sense. This is just, you know, um, country, country boy knowledge here. 
All right. So outside of the whole Nelson Mandela, have you had anything else weird happen that you can't understand? A lot of the other ones, like the Monopoly guy, you know, with the eyeglass, that kind of stuff. A lot of those, um, the Berenstein, Berenstein one, I recall that one. Um, Ford with the little squiggle on it. I remember seeing it the other way. Uh, there's been a number, but a lot of the ones that a lot of the, 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 the other people have as well. Um, you know, I have a, I have a gentleman that I, I, I interview every once in a while and he's really into this topic. And, uh, he tells me that his sources have told him that the people operating the CERN put themselves in a Faraday cage and they ran a test and they were running a test to see if they could, could go back and augment time and change things. And there's little differences that are coming every, every, every time on these, on these, on these, uh, simultaneous time timelines. Um, he's really into the topic. He can speak clearer than I can, of course. I mean, I don't get too much into CERN other than there's something funky. And when, you know, when the statue in front of the CERN is the dancing God Shiva, you know, the God of d destruction, um, you know, it just gives, and it's, and it's built on Apollo's, um, um, uh, you know, place of origin as well on earth. There's a lot of occultism built into this, into this object. Well, this here, here's something that happened to me recently. Every, every couple of months I interview one of my heroes in this field, a gentleman and researcher named David Weatherly. Okay. And David has, I'm always trying to be on top for some reason. I've known David. He's been doing the show for like four years and I still get nervous every time he's on because like he's much smarter than me and it kind of intimidates me a little bit because he's got that real dry attitude. Like nothing rattles him, nothing, you know, he's never emotional about anything and, and it, it rattles me anyway. So I'm always trying to look for topics that we haven't talked about. So here I am on my computer researching and it pops up on, on my Instagram. It was either Facebook or Instagram of a book that he has written called, what was it? Sea serpents or sea monsters of the great lakes. So here I am about, you know, you and I met up before showtime and I've got David on the phone and we're talking right before showtime. I said, Dave, I'm real excited to talk about your new book about sea serpents of the Great Lakes. He goes, dude, that's a great topic. He goes, there's a lot of stuff going on up there and I'm starting to get excited. He goes, however, we have a problem. I said, what is that? He goes, I haven't written that book. Whoa. I'm like, dude, what are, you, what are you talking about? I just saw it on your profile. I saw the cover. I saw the name by David Weatherly underneath. It was Sam Sheeran, his artist rendering on it. I Whoa. said, and he's like, no, I haven't read the book. I haven't written that book. He goes, that's a book I may have to do in the future. But no, wow. he, he goes, it's not in my library of books. I haven't even written it. That's intense. That That's one, intense. that one tripped me out. And then two and a half weeks later, I have a daytime job and I'm usually very quiet about what I do because I like to have some semblance of privacy mm -hmm. in my life uh, outside of the political, uh, you know, outside of the popularity of this show. And I was doing some paperwork, doing some research on a project and I had signed off on it, told my clients about what I was doing for them. And two days later, went back into my computer with my boss to look at this, this entire project that we were working on and what I had seen and told the customer was completely opposite. It was gone. Huh. And this is on record by, by a secure number. What, what, what do you think is happening? Do you, do you think I that the timeline is just resetting It's shifting? I have um, no idea. You know, if, if you could go back and, and, and change history for the last day or two or three and things are a little bit different or weak, even there's going to be some things that are shifting. I would think, uh, you know, maybe time isn't linear. Maybe it's like a record player, you know, and you can just, it's spinning. You can just pick that and pick up that little needle and you can just move it over an inch and drop it down. And you're, uh, yeah. you know, um, it, it just absolutely tripped me out. It tripped me out big time. And I don't understand it. I don't get it. It di doesn't make sense to me. I've never really experienced anything like this in my life. 
And I'm having a real tough time with, with seeing that. And to me, it is completely what we call Mandela effect. What happened? What I think is happening, if you, if you ask my opinion, and I'll, I'll give you my opinion, I'll get your, yours, uh, whether you can counter it or not. I think what's happening is that we as a society are every day starting to walk into these timelines. This is why we, we see Bigfoot. This is why we see Dogman. This is why we see the Thunderbird, or people make claims of seeing the Thunderbird. I mean, you think about it, man, a 40-foot bird out there, that is going to leave some massive bird droppings. It's going to paint giant green trees white. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Car cars are going to be white, yet we don't see it. Yet there are people who are having these instances where it's almost like they're looking into a different timeline. And I think what's happening, Gesundheit, I think what is happening is we are getting projections into other timelines. And that's maybe what happened, what's happening here. I don't know. It's just a personal thought and theory on that. I could be completely wrong, but that's just what I'm, I'm, I'm wondering. Yeah, and this is the topic of many sci-fi movies. Remember the movie The Fog, where them creatures came through? Uh, terrifying movie. Uh, there's been many like that. Um, I, I, I don't know either. It, it could very well be. It could very well be. Um, but I, I always go back to the computer sim simulation. You would just have to reprogram some something new in here um, and, and into a counter timeline. And uh, you know, the scariest part to me is the cognitive dissidence. We need a reality. We need a firm reality to base our life upon and I'm, I'm very earth ground i mean you see my 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 symbol here this is the the solar cross this is the four the the symbol for earth for for structure for 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 tangibility um i am in these topics but i'm very skeptic i'm a very proof oriented person even though i've had some metaphysical experiences um i'm very grounded into this world and these kinds of things that we talk about are very unsettling and very unnerving to me on a fundamental level because if you don't have you know, if you can't wake up every day and coffee's going to taste the way it is and you're, you know, uh, the, the density of your planet, the earth is going to be the way it, you know, things have to be the same way every day for us to function. And as these Mandela effects keep happening, people are questioning reality. And um, when nothing means anything anymore and everything is arbitrary and subjective, and this is why politically I'm a conservative. I don't like a lot of change in subjectivity. I'm a very objective person. Um, I don't like that subjectivity. And when the world itself changes like this, it's sort of terrifying. It's sort of terrifying. Um, just from a day-to-day -day survival based, um, um, uh, um, angle, for like a better, better, better word. So I don't know. That's what I got on that topic, but those are my feelings on it all the, the, the way around. People also have very subjective experiences in this world and we see things differently and it's due to our filters. You know, we have uh, your eyes are it might be better or worse than mine. Um, your 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 memories, your your ability to uh, see and hear. You have all these filters. Uh, your religious filters, your environmental filters, and we all take in information at different rates. And I'm wondering if that doesn't deal with our subjectivity as well. But what happens when you can change reality for one person but not, not another? And the world's different for people. You know, um, it's scary stuff when you look at it that way. Well, we haven't yet talked about your personal experiences. You've 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 dealt with men in black or what you believe. I'd love for you to go down that road because that's always a a key interest of mine, these men in black. So I had sort of a men in black experience. Um I had a guy who walked in one time and he was seven foot tall. He was big. And um he was in one of my stations. We owned and operated gas stations throughout Arizona when I was younger. Our family did. And he looked and there was just something about him that, and he I didn't buy anything. He just stood there and he looked at me and then he walked out. It was simple. It wasn't, it wasn't a huge transaction. Wasn't anything happened, but they do was not human. I've had people also come to me in lines and walk into restaurants and just this unsettling feeling. But I had a, I had sort of a, a men in black experience one time, uh, more of an agent than a man in black come through this little town I lived in and asked me where the underground tunnels were that led to the underground facility. And I was working in, uh, we used to own the gas station, wiki up Arizona. And, um, 
this guy came in and he starts asking me, I'm, I'm working the cash register. He's like, Hey, where are those? Where do you, do you live here? I'm like, yeah, I live here. It's in the middle of nowhere. You know, where do you think I drive in? He's like, okay, where are those tunnels at? I said, what tunnels? He goes, the, the tunnels that go under the, the, the town to the f facility. I'm like, I've never heard of the tunnels, man. He's like, how many minutes? I've been here for three years. I've never heard of any tunnels. He went over and asked some other employees and he sat down and um, he kept asking about these tunnels. And I went over there. I sat down with him for a minute. I'm like, I really don't know what you're talking about. Well, I followed him outside. He, he had on these shiny black shoes and I followed him outside and he got into go plates with government plates and he drove off. And, uh, and, um, later that day I went over to my friend because, you know, back in the day I was reading a lot of David Icke and a lot of uh, Cooper and, you know, we're in the middle of nowhere and we're seeing things every, I've, I've, I've seen UFOs my whole life out there. I've seen stuff fly over. It's not like, you know, how, you know, if you're going to see a UFO tonight, if you go up on the mountain out in the hills and take a six pack of beer and sit back, listen to the radio and look up, you're going to see stuff every single night. And we did for, for 10 years. So I, I go to one of my friends and she says, oh yeah, he was in here too, asking everyone about these tunnels. Well, um, I, like I said, I, 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 I cowboyed for a time up there during this as well. And I knew a cowboy and he says, oh yeah, no, no, there's a, there's an underground facility up here by 93 and 40. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I was up on this hill. And he says, come on, I'll show you. And he took me out there and he says that, 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 he pointed out this little shed down there. And he says, you'll see this, um, this, uh, caravan of uh, SUVs pull up and they go about one by one into the shed and they shut the door and another one comes in and it can only fit two. And they fit four, five, six, six in there. Um, you know, if you, I know if, if you, if you type in UFO map or the underground base map, wiki up Arizona, which is a place name, it's like 300 people out there, including dogs and horses. Right. Um, it's on this map that was written back in the seventies. And it's just, um, um, it's been this place where we've seen things and I, and I, I, I lived out there for 10 years and, um, everyone out there has had experiences where things have landed, um, a craft, uh, triangular craft, like a pyramid type craft landed in the river bottom. Um, you know, we've had those experiences out there plenty, plenty of times. Um, I've seen things out put put out put pushing cattle out there. Even in the daytime, we've seen craft fly fly across at speeds that aren't. Um, we don't have any any um, craft that can do that as well. So I mean, I don't know. I've had lots of experiences in the the desert. And I've heard of lots of experiences. Well, well let's desert. talk. Let's talk about the desert here. What makes the desert so significant regarding these experiences? Because all over Arizona, especially around the Sedona area, we hear there there are people who believe there is a, a portal over that area that where the UFOs fly into what makes the desert. One of these weird places. Phoenix, especially is an ancient, ancient place. Okay. Before the Americans were here, um, this was known as Pimeria and it was the Pima tribe lived here before the Pimas. It was the, it was the, um, the, uh, Spanish, um, or sorry, the, um, well, it was the, Mexicans. It was part of Mexico. Then before that was Spain. And before Spain, it was the Hohokam Empire. Before that, it was the basket weaving cultures. Before then, the, the archaic cultures. There have been people living in this valley, the Valley of the Sun, we, we, we call it for a long, long time. Um, do you know there's an ancient canal bed under no. Phoenix? So the Hohokam are, 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 are credit is given to the Hohokam who, who, who dug this, um, dug this canal system. There's over 1,000 miles. 1,000 miles of canals dug into the Phoenix Basin, okay? 200 miles of these canals are 50 to 70 feet across by 20 feet deep. And that's 54.6 million cubic yards of earth or 54.6 million truckloads of earth. Those are called trunk canals, and they truncate into the Salt River. They then stem off into 800 miles of feeder canals and ditch canals, which then irrigate about 100,000 acres of land, okay? These canals were dug to a perfect gradient of a four-feet drop per mile, and um, this culture that supposedly dug this had no written language, no mathematics, no metallurgy skills, no wheel, and no pack animals. Yet they dug a canal system that is on par, quote unquote, uh, from the archaeologist that I spoke to at the uh, mu museum down there at the at the um, uh, where this is showcased at. And when I was researching it, she says the amount of engineering and labor involved to build this canal system is on par with what is setting on the Giza plateau. It just doesn't get talked about. And to this day, there's a canal behind my house right, right now. I have one of the original Hohokam canals. When the founding fathers of Phoenix moved into this valley, they could not improve upon the gradient 
or the grade of this canal system. And we just dug them out and we put concrete in them and we use them to this day. Phoenix is ancient. I think things have been going on here for a long, long, long time. Um, we were founded by, 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 by Masons. We were founded by a guy by the name of Lord Daryl Dupa and Jack Swilling. Dupa was a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Mason. Um, we were going to be named, um, a swilling. We were going to be named, uh, our first name was pumpkinville, by the way. Right. That was a horrible name. They were going to name us uh, Selena after the salt river and, uh, uh, Dupa who's buried in the Masonic graveyard. And, and I want to, I want to expand on this and, and pull us up. So I'm going to come full all the way around back to aliens in a minute here. But, um, I think this was on the Masons plan to build this uh, society here that became Phoenix. He said, you know, all around us, gentlemen, you know, ancient ruins lie and dry can, can canal beds. And I see a city rising in these ashes. Let it be named Phoenix. And boom, Phoenix, Arizona was named Tempe, Arizona, where ASU is at. It's named after the Vale of Tempe in Greece. Um, we have a lot of Masonic names from the high, from the 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 hier the hier hier hieroglyphic mountains up to the north, the Cleopatra Mine, which was huge in the the development of the state. I believe that certain powers that be know and understand how ancient Phoenix is and the power that that is is here. They used to say that between thirty and sixty thousand Native Americans lived in this valley in its in its height in the Holcomb Empire. Today they put that number closer to about two hundred thousand, and where you know the same as the Giza Plateau, the same as all these ancient ancient cultures. There's nothing new under the sun. There's real power here. I think the powers that be came to redevelop it. And if you want to get into the into, into the, uh, the the extraterrestrials, we go down to Mount Graham down by by a Tucson, which is Hohokam territory as well. And they have the Lucifer lens up there, right? Yes, up on top of Mount Graham. Um, I, I explain for our listeners who do not understand what the Lucifer lens is. Large bionic, sorry, large binocular telescopic near infrared spectroscopic utility with camera and integral field unit for extra galactic research. That's what it stands for, the Lucifer lens. And tell them who who happens to own that, sir. The Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> the Vatican owns it. Now, did you know this is built on top of Mount Graham, and Mount Graham is sacred to the Apaches? Do you know that the Vatican? was sued by the Apaches um, because they did not want them building on top of the sacred mountain. And they went to court for about a year and a half over it before they realized that the Vatican was going to outspend them. And um, the reason being is because on top of Mount Graham is where the portal used to open and the gods would come through to the Apaches and give them knowledge and seeds and other things. That's where the Lucifer lens is today. You go on further down to Phoenix and you have the Sierra de Estrellas uh, to the southwest of Phoenix. And that means the uh, the mountain of the stars. Um, it's named that for the road. The, the Butterfield's uh, stage went behind it to the south and named it the Camino de, de uh, Sierra de, de, de Estrellas because you used to have to take that road at nighttime, right? Because otherwise the Apaches would kill you or the um, or the, or the sun would kill the, 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 the horses. Well, up on top of that mountain was another Stargate. And all the Pima talk about the Stargate up on top of that mountain range. You got the Superstition Mountains between both of those off to the east here in the valley. And, uh, you know, I've done shows, whole shows on the Superstition Mountains. The Apaches um, called it the the, uh, the abode of the Thunder Gods. They said that's where the giants lived. The Gwyndipids, they would come down. The Pima said that the giants would live up there and they would come down. And they would take women and they would take children. They'd eat them regularly. This valley here in Phoenix is is just uh, chock full of ancient stories of little people who live at the top of that mountain and giants and flood stories and portals and openings and UFOs. Remember the Phoenix lights, the largest mass sighting of a UFO in the history of earth ever happened over Phoenix, Arizona. And, um, people saw it right. 60, 60,000 people witnessed it in real time. So this is a very special place. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the geology of the area. Well, I've talked a lot about skinwalkers in the past. I've done full, 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 full shows on that. That's a, that's a regional, um, phenomenon. Um, the only thing, you know, between like, you know, uh, the Hopi and the Navajo and the Paiute up to the, the North, they all talk about skinwalkers, but they have well, the Grand Canyon. Let's talk okay. about this when we come back. We have Corey Daniel for another 30 minutes here on Spaced Out Radio. We're going to stick it out in the desert. Weird stories. 
coming up to kick off hour three of Spaced Out Radio. Then we got the news wired, the thought of the Dave, a jam packed hour three. Next, stay tuned. All right, we are clear. I will be right back here, my friend, and uh, we'll talk to you in a few seconds or a couple minutes, okay? Cool, man. All right. Be right back, guys.
All right, sorry about that. It's uh, my dog was being an idiot outside, so I do apologize for that. Sorry about that. We're good. All right. Um, Bomber asking, what are we doing for Dave's birthday? Uh, Ian Holt is going to join us. Oh, you smoke a pipe. I'm so jealous right now. So jealous. You, the be- you, you can smoke a pipe too. The beard and the pipe. I You don't understand my town. My town doesn't have a McDonald's or a Taco Bell. <laughs> That's good. That's good. No, it's not because I had breakfast burritos. I broke my diet this morning and had breakfast burritos when I had to go out of town because I haven't had them in like three years. Terrible. Just don't have them for dinner. No, of course not. That's do, you have a, do, you, do you do you do you do you do you do you have pipes? I don't even know where to find a pipe in my town outside of a pot pipe. Oh man, that, that ain't good. Stay away, yeah. stay away from the devil's herb. Yeah. All right. Uh hi Anthony Foster. How you doing? Thurston Howell the third. Nice to see you. We're <laughs> gonna get going here momentarily. Aiden, Jeremy. Cat Chaser and John, thank you so much for the super chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this show. And uh, we're going to get going here in about five seconds. So sit tight. Last half hour with uh, Corey coming up now. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Here we go with the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. We want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Panto Pragmatic. Panto Pragmatic is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com. We have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce a good friend here on Spaced Out Radio. We have... Corey Daniel, we are talking about his experiences of the Phoenix Enigma and what's going on in the desert where he is currently residing in Arizona. Corey, welcome back. Thank you, sir. All right. Little people, giants, legends, you've had it all happen to you. Yeah. I'd love for you to explain this. Well, you know, a lot of people, they just don't immerse themselves in their local history. And I made an active choice to do just that when I was growing up and my circumstances, you know, uh, allowed me to do so. And I figure I'm not going to be an academic in the true sense of a government sanctioned academic. So I'm just going to go and go live and explore. And I did, and I met people and I talked to them and I started interviewing years ago and just talking to people, getting their stories down. And there's tons of stories of people going through shiny doors in the desert and getting lost for weeks or months at a time. There's a story up in, up in that, up in that area. Um, there was a story, uh, it happened probably in the sixties. I think it was, there was a cowboy who was living up there and he was in this mountain range. I'm not going to say where, cause I got a lot of work to do up there still. And, um, we go on expeditions actually out there and we, we, um, we do field search, field research out there as well. A lot of it's untapped still, but he went out there and he like, he went missing. And he came back like a month later, I think it was, if I recall the story straight, I got it written down somewhere. And uh, they said, where you been? And he said, I got lost. They said, you got, I mean, you got lost. It's, it's, you got lost in this mountain range, and, you know, and, and he's a cowboy. He wrote it and he said, yeah, I was chasing this, uh, this calf up there. And, uh, it, it, I, I, and things, things just turned. They turned on me. I got lost. I, I roamed around. I was hunting out there, eating deer and everything for, for what felt like a couple months. He said, no, you've been gone for a couple months. We thought you're dead. And, um, and, uh, 
weird deal. Uh, this cowboy got lost out there and he said, yeah, things got all shiny and weird. I'll tell you a story. Um, uh, my, uh, my ex, one, one of my ex-wives, I've been successfully married twice. My, uh, my, my first ex-wife was Guatemalan and or sorry, second. And, uh, I went down to Guatemala. We, we, we built a house down there and I hunted in the jungle with Mayans. Um, they were all, you know, a lot of purebred Mayans down, down there. Her family's half Mayan. And, um, I'm out there in the jungle, my friend in my first day out there. And I got this like Vietnam era, 12 gauge shotgun that they gave me to, 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 to hunt deer, 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 deer with and oscillated turkeys. And he says, Oh, Hey, Hey, you know, he's speaking Spanish and I'm, I'm doing my, my best. I didn't speak it that great back in the day. He says, when you're standing here waiting for the deer, if you look down and you look back up and things aren't the same, don't move. I said, what? He goes, don't move. Look back down, count to 10, look back up again. And the world should slide back into place. I said, what? He goes, I said, what are you talking about? He goes, things change out here. And if you move and you know things are different, we'll be able to hear you, but we won't be able to find you again. You're, you're gone. You will lose you. You won't come back. I said, are you, are, you, are you joking? He says, no, I'm not joking. He said, I was raised out here. It's the first thing we tell our kids out here. And, and I said, what cause, what, what is it? He says, well, the closest thing I can think of in, in your language is magnetics. It's some kind of a magnetic field, you know, and I, as I got to know him over months and months and months, he opened up about, and he was a, he was a vaquero. He was a cowboy. He told me about the time when a craft flew right over and scared all of his men and cattle and they were all sitting there and he had two, two of his men there. And they said, no, it's real. We, we, we all saw it. These are real things. Um, and, you know, I've had a few of those experiences in the, in the desert as well. There was a, there was a gentleman, um, I, that, that prospector in my, my, my bio that you uh, read there, he was a friend of mine. And he said that a, a guy came around years ago, back in the, I think it was the eighties even. And, uh, he'd been in the VA hospital and, uh, he said he'd gotten out of the Prescott VA hospital. He's making his way back up North, North again. And he says, I used to prospect here like back in the thirties, uh, when I was a kid, before I went to the, the, the war. And, uh, he said up Sycamore Canyon right there. I got to tell, I got to, he's like, got to tell somebody there was this, uh, there was this window, this door would open. It was a shiny door. This piece of it's just door. And he says, I used to look at it and he said, my mule was scared to death of it, but I'd throw rocks into it and it would, they would disappear and I could walk around it and there's nothing there. And then someday sometimes it'd be there and sometimes it wouldn't, it would just come and go. Um, you know, I thought that was kind of weird. You know, some old guy telling me this, uh, he, he swore by it though. Um, he said he hadn't been up that Canyon in decades. Um, but he was coming through and thought he'd tell somebody about it. There are stories of these doors everywhere. The little people, you know, the little people of Mount Shasta, well, up in the superstition mountains, there's a story of these little people that the Pima talk about. And, um, they came via a ship from the sky and they came down. Um, these are real stories. If you go to Sedona, there's thunder mountain there right? Or Grayback Mountain, it's known as. And the story from the Sanaguan culture and more, more, um, oh, my dog's butt here. Um, sorry, my, uh, uh, the, 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 the Yavapai tribe talk about, um, the little people that lived up in this mountain and they could, they could kill you with their thoughts and they were strong, stronger than normal humans. And people were scared to death of them. They call it, thund, 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 they call it Thunder Mountain because lightning and thunder would like shoot out of it. Um, at different times, you know, um, a friend of mine over on the Yavapai res, he's probably the closest thing to a medicine man that they have left over, over, over there. Now he told me, uh, one night out there about the little people and the invisible giant hairy people like invisible Bigfoots that wander around the res. And I said, how come we don't have these in Phoenix? How come they're only out here? And he says, you know, I've thought a lot about that. He says, I think it's electro electromagnetics. You have Wi-Fi." And you have electrical lines everywhere in your houses and all that stuff. And you're, you're, you're being bathed in these, in these, uh, these fields. We don't have that out here. That's why when you go into the, in, into the hills and the woods and the desert, we have the natural ener energies out there still. And, um, whatever is coming through, whatever, um, whatever natural machine of vibration and energy or whatever that would be, it's permitting it. It's facilitating it to come through. Whereas when you build up, into civilization and city with a you know, electricity. You don't get that. Uh, that was his thought. Um, you know, uh, a Navajo medicine man sort of told me the same thing years later. He says, he talked to me about the ley lines 
that would come through and they would have to move their, their Hogan's because if, if, because they were always shifting and if they were shifted through someone's house, um, it would cause men to start drinking. It would cause, uh, you know, all kinds of bad stuff to happen and it would, the energy would, uh, cause entropy and dis-ease within the family and they would have to build a new house. So he would come out there and he would, uh, gauge where these ley lines were crossing their, and then the way it could take two, three, four years for it to move through. And I thought that's interesting. But then I realized that's exactly what the Catholic church does. Do you know, every time a Catholic church is built, a priest has to come out and go over the area and check out for its energy. True. I did not know that. Yep. They, before they even start construction, he's got to go out there and do this thing. Yeah. So, um, I asked him why about the energy and he says, you know, and I, I actually talked about s- I asked him about Sedona and I think your, your listeners will be interested in this because everyone loves topics about Sedona and I've written full art, 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 articles and done full shows on this town, this area. But he said that, um, he said that we used to call the people that live in Sedona, meaning the ancient people, the, the Yavapai and the uh, Sinaguan means the without water people or the dry people. We, uh, we, we had a name for him. He told me what it was, but I forget it. He said, it means the people who live in the red land to the South and they live a little bit longer and they're a little bit wiser and they're healthier and they were smarter and happier all the way around. Um, and I said, he says, it's the area. I said, what do you mean the area? He says, well, do you know how you guys don't build schools under power lines? I said, yeah, causes cancer. He goes, that's right. It's the electrons that come down off of it and they cause cells to mutate upon division and it's, it's cancer. It's entropy. So yeah, he goes, well, imagine in the earth, if you would, um, a certain machine, if you will, a uh, natural machine of ore or a water table naturally occurring with a ley line that does just the opposite or at least slows it down. So in relation to everybody else, where entropy is occurring at a faster rate, if you're in this bubble where a water table is on, you know, a coal or whatever, whatever natural elements are occurring. And I'm talking physics now, measurable physics. It's slowing down the rate of entropy. So in relation to every, everyone else and, or reversing it. And these are these magic spots in the desert that the natives would go to like castle hot springs, North of Phoenix. That was the first territorial capital of Arizona that the Rockefellers went to and the Carnegie's went to and uh, JFK went to and these healing springs um, that come from the deep rock water, 7,500 feet deep, the deepest area, the deepest rock water in the state just happens to be the first place that all these wealthy people came to in the mid 1800s when they came out here. There's an ancient knowledge base that we're not giving as the proletariat, as the average citizen, one that is held, I believe by these, um, secret societies and people of power, these families, um, you know, the expansion to the new world, was no different than the expansion out West and is no different than the business expansion and now space and technology expansion. It's the same families doing the same thing. Um, when we first, when we end up going to space, it's not going to be us first. It's going to be those families that are doing it and they're going to conquer it and they're going to set the infrastructure and then the horseshoers and then the retailers and then the shoemakers are going to come up there, whatever, whatever the job's going to be. Nothing's changed. I think all these places of power, be it the, 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 the Lucifer lens up on top of Mount Graham or Sedona, now the most expensive real estate in Arizona or, or the castle hot springs, which has been sequestered away and is now closed again. Um, very powerful places. And I, and I add, I would add national parks to that. You know, uh, David Politis missing four one one has done amazing work and, uh, people will go missing all over the country and they're, they're, they're clustered on these, um, yes. Right. Well, the number you know, the no, the number one cluster is in is in uh, oh what's uh, Yosemite Yosemite and yeah. number t- number two is in North Vancouver. Yep, that's right, that's right. And there, we of course there's Yellowstone National Park. There's the Grand Canyon area. Do you know that aside from one little place up in Oregon, Coquino County, which is basically from Flagstaff from S- Sedona north to Flagstaff all the way up to the Utah border, is I think the number two per capita uh, sightings of UFOs in North America, it's that high. And that's right there on the Navajo res. It's right there with Humphreys peak Sedona and this, um, uh, this uh, underground military f- facility. That's not officially an underground military facility. So you have these large swaths of land that have been grabbed up by the, uh, by the federal government and they're, 
protected, right? Well, what better way to manage whatever these are caves? Well, first of all, you know, if you, if you, if you overlay a cave system map, the known caves, if you overlay uh, in, in North America, if you overlay that over David Politis's missing clusters, you know, it's an exact match. There's I mean, a lot of strange ones. Yeah. Like and that. so, so, so yeah. So when the, you, the, the tunnels out East are like that too. Okay. Yeah. There's something going on underground. I'm convinced of that. Um, you know, all the tunnel boring machines. Um, I got a friend who's sort of a whistleblower. I haven't really talked about too much, but he delivers goods and products for the U S military. And he confirmed that there's three underground bases in Arizona. There's not supposed to be any, but he says, Oh no. And I said, how do you know this? Cause I deliver stuff to them. They're, they're not where you think that they would be. Um, really? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of weird stuff that goes on in Arizona. We are an underpopulated state. Um, in today's day and age, we're growing rapidly. We really are growing. Um, we have, um, one, one of, I think we, aside from, you know what? We might've surpassed them. We have 32 or 33 now observatories. Uh, we have low population density. We have a lot of rural land, tons of state and national parks. Um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on here. A lot of paranormal stuff that goes on in the woods, in the hills, in the desert. I find it fascinating and there's no shortage of stuff to, to uh, talk to. And now you have Bill, Bill, Bill Gates building uh, Belmont out east of town. It's going to be the first, uh, um, you know, huge uh, cashless modern day city. One of these super cities that they're, they're trying to build. We have servers coming in left and right. And you think about it. Why? Well, we have no earthquakes. We have no floods to, to speak of, right? Doesn't flood like it does down, down, down south. We have no hurricanes. We have no tornadoes. Nothing happens here. It's you guys are boring. You're <laughs> yeah. Boring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we, we get a lot of Canadians. You like Canadians. Well, somebody has got to support the economy. <laughs> so I'm waiting for the border to open up so I can get to Vegas and support the economy of Nevada. Oh, you like Vegas? Oh yeah. You ever down, down to Laughlin? I, I have not yet. Laughlin's cool. Yeah. I have, I have not yet, but it's it's on the list. It is on the list. We have about seven minutes left with you tonight. Mm -hmm. And you've mentioned the little people a lot tonight. Mm -hmm. This really interests me because the First Nations up here where I live, they talk very frequently about the little people and up on the mountains. And if you don't treat them with respect, they will screw with you. They will mess with you. They are tricksters. And are you noticing that down there as well? Um, I've had experiences in the desert. Um, I've had some, I haven't talked about the big one that people usually like, like me to talk about, but I, I had another one as well. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there's stories of little people everywhere. Um, I did a tour one time years ago. You have a tribe. You're out of Vancouver. You said I I'm about five and a half hours North of Vancouver. Okay. Right on the board there. There's a pin that I got from, um, a native American lady. You heard of a tribe called the Lil Watt, L I L W A T Lil Watt. No, no. there's about 2000 of them left or so, maybe 1500, um, little short people, like, like really, really tiny people. And they were, they were elders and they came down here for the summit. And, um, I asked her from their, for her creation story. It was a private tour. We went to the grand Canyon and I told her, I, we talked about plants all day long and botany and they, they were, they were healers. And I said, do you have stories of giants? She says, yeah, us. And they laughed. And I said, we mean, you, they said, we, we were once giants. Our tribe was once giants. All of our men were great warriors and the women were very tall and proud, but, but the men became violent and they made war for no reason. And the women did not take care of the kids and they traded, you know, things for sexual favors. Uh, same story as the Hopi, by the way, identical story. And he says, God came down and he made us small. He made us small to, to make us, to, to, to make us di 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 diminutive so that we would not, um, uh, corrupt the world any, 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 any longer. So there's that side of the little people story, but there's also the ones, the little people that the, that all the natives feared and the Pima talked about them greatly down here. The Pima uh, was uh, the ancestors of the, uh, well, uh, they were the progeny of the, um, of the Hohokam, that ancient culture I talked about. And they said that the little people lived up in the superstition mountains or on all of the mountains. And, no one really knows what they were, or where they came from, but they always had, they were always tricksters. They were highly intelligent. Um, they had these superpowers. They're physically strong and they had mental powers to make, make people do things. 
I think the most famous one is a story out of Mount Shasta, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the Mount Shasta area is home to a lot of these. And of course, Ireland, they're everywhere. The question is, are they interdimensional? Are they physical? Are they, do they actually live in these caves? Is that why the U.S. government took over these national parks? There's something there. Um, I believe the reason why the National Park Service, which um, you know, to, uh, 2012 was 100 years year, years years old, I, I I think it came around, came into fruition when it did because the West was filling up and uh, things were being seen and recovered. Then they had to insert yellow journalism to cover up for quite a bit of the stuff. Um, I don't know what what do they talk about the little people up there? What 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 do they say? Up here, they are very mystical, and and I know that when the little people come down, when they are upset with people within the First Nations community, they will start stealing things, jewelry, things like that of importance. And so quickly, uh, friends of mine on that are First Nations in the area will have to quickly make uh, stuff to try and trade back for the jewelry. So my friend's mother actually had her jewelry stolen. Uh -huh. by the little people. Yeah. And, and so my friend was, I, I said to him one day, I said, what, what did you do the last couple of nights? He goes, I've just been making trinkets. He goes, little hats, little jewelry for the little people, because we're trying to get my mom's jewelry back. They made an offering of, of, of the, the trinkets as well as some food. And they sat downstairs and about an hour later, they started hearing noise of rustling around upstairs. And when they went upstairs after it went silent, all of mom's jewelry were sitting back on the little, on the little tray. You just sparked a memory. Um, there was my friend out on the Yavapai res, um, just east of town here. They built a casino and he is, he is a He, he see, he lives in both dimensions. He sees the little people all the time. He says they're, they're everywhere. I see him when they come out, you know, they, they usually go away at nighttime and the big, the big, tall, hairy ones come out and the little ones, but they're in the day. So we built a casino and I told, and he said, I told the chief and I told the council, do not leave milk out for them. They're going to be attracted. They're going to, they're coming for the coins. They love coins. They love trinkets. He says, but they want well, someone left. One of the ladies left milk out for them and they've stayed and there's nothing but trouble. They're very mischievous. Um, and, uh, that's what he told me. He said, we had to do this thing and, uh, you can't cleanse them. You have to lure them away. And we lured them back out of the casino because they're breaking our machines and they're causing trouble with the bingo games. That's what he told me. Um, and uh, he talks about it. And what's interesting is when he's talking about that, because he's probably the most metaphysical one of the bunch. The other, um, his peers, his natives, the elderly, they just sit down, they put their head down and they just listen. No one corrects him. No one says, oh man, you know, quit, quit, quit Josh and these people, you know. Um, it's it's a very real thing. And, oh, yeah. Uh, I, there's something to it without a doubt. There's something to it. I believe um, he says they're interdimensional and they live on the other side. And if you learn to, to look and see, and I, I mentioned earlier um, about the other side there, uh, there's a gentleman lived in the East called um, Tom Brown. And he was trained by one of the last Apache scouts by the name of uh, stalking wolf and stalking wolf taught him. And he, he actually teaches the military. Now Tom Brown does um, uh, Rangers and Navy, Navy, Navy seals teach them all kinds of uh, desert or, or sorry, wild, 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 wilderness skills and whatnot. But he taught him that observation is next to spirituality. And when you learn to observe your surroundings and immerse yourself into it, you will then become on the other side and, and, and you will live in the, in the dual worlds at the same time. Um, and stalking wolf could go between worlds back and forth. And I think we've lost a lot of that. Uh, stalking wolf all stalking wolf also said that because his, his lifelong mission and goal was to find the root of all religion. He said, if you can take a religion with you out into the wilderness and it works for you and everybody else, if you take it out there naked with nothing other than what God gave you in God's church, it's a true path. Get rid of the dogma, get rid of the ceremony, get rid of all the candles and the ends of everything and just get back to nature. And if you can do that, that is the true religion of earth and you will begin to live that duality with it. And that's when you, that's when he would begin to commune with the other entities on the other side. My friend, it is that time where we have to say goodnight to you. A show that has flown on by here. Corey Daniel, thank you for explaining the Phoenix Enigma and all your research on Spaced Out Radio. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right, Corey Daniel, everybody, the Phoenix Enigma. You can look it up online there. It's right there for you. Coming up next, we have the SOR Newswire. We have the thought of the Dave. Stay tuned. Spaced Out Radio, 
continues right after this. Great show, man. Good. I hope it was. We'll give you some claps for that. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me on here. No worries, man. No worries. It was a pleasure. You know what? That The little people uh, just reminded me of a story. My buddy told me this. Uh, we were talking about it recently. My buddy, uh, Mike, he um, he was out hunting for, for rabbits and, and grouse one day in this gravel pit. And he, he gets out of his vehicle and he is, you know, walking around, just checking to see if there's any tracks on the ground. And I'm 15 miles away. I'm at my daytime office and clear as day. He hears my voice, Mike, help me come in here, help mm -hmm. me. And he said it wasn't coming from one area. It was coming all around him. Like the sound was emanating all around him and it freaked him out and he left. And, you know, I've heard of skinwalkers doing this. I've heard of, um, Wendigos doing this. So I asked one of my first nations friends about this, one of the elders, uh, locally here. And he's like, no, we don't have any of those here. He goes, but he goes, the little people would do that if they felt threatened. And he goes, if your friend would have went into the forest, you would have never seen him again. Yeah. People disappear all over the place. Uh, <laughs> they really do. Yeah. People go disappearing all the oh, time yeah. in the world. Oh yeah, man. Oh yeah. Uh, I just want to say, uh, a H V Y H X. Uh, thank you for coming on. Uh, and, uh, on space out radio in our chat room mm -hmm. tonight, really do appreciate that. America's quilt. Good to see you back in the chat room. Thank you for joining us. I think you've been here before. Yeah, I think so. All right. We're good. Yeah. My friend, I want to say a big thank you. No, oh, thank and you for inviting I, I had a lot of fun. You're a great speaker. Well deserved. If you'd like to have me on again, you know where to find me. Um, we we'll can do masonry or anything else you want to talk about. Yeah. It was just a fun rolling conversation tonight. And I appreciate you, man. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Take care. Good night. Corey Daniel, everyone. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I want you guys just to sit uh, nicely here. Hey, Randy Spurl, how you doing? I am uh, just going to go run and refill my, my water here because I don't have much. I'm dying of thirst. I'll be right back. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate that. I'm glad you guys really enjoyed Corey. Hey, Rich Hilke, how you doing, man? Good to have you here. <clears throat> we got a good news wire coming up. Thank you to Michelle. And to Vinster, Aiden, 
Jeremy, Cat Chaser, and John for the amazing super chats in supporting our great show, Spaced Out Radio. Thank you to all of our new subscribers here on the show. We really appreciate it. And uh, for those of you who've hit the subscribe button, we are here nightly, seven days a week. I'm here Monday through Friday. Lynn Wallington is here Saturday. Michael W. Hall on Sunday. And we really do appreciate you guys coming on in. Hey, Beehive Chuckles, how are you? Thanks for coming on in. We're going to get this thing going here, the final half hour. And uh, we're going to get it going here in about four seconds. We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. We want to say hello to everyone all around, wherever you may be, and remind you that all of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Speaking of the news, let's do this thing, shall we? News is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the question mark. And the reason why I call it a question mark is if I was American, I would be upset by this. I really would be upset by this. And I'm going to read the story, and then I want you to tell me whether or not you're upset. I think you should be. And I'm not trying to put put words in your mouth or anything like this, but let me read the story and then I'll tell you why. For some time, expressing interest in unidentified flying objects or UFOs has been deemed mostly unacceptable in wider society. But that attitude appears to be changing in America with luminaries from Barack Obama to former NBA star Shaquille O'Neal sharing their thoughts. Obama was asked about the UFO issue during a television interview and the former president confirming footage and records of unidentified objects exist. Much of the newfound and newly sincere interest in UFOs appears to stem from a report on 60 Minutes, which tackled the U.S. government's grudging acknowledgement of UFOs, with the Defense Department and intelligence agencies due to deliver a much-anticipated official report on mysterious aerial sightings next month. 60 Minutes interviewed a number of credible witnesses, including former Navy pilot who said that he had seen unidentified aerial phenomena, the government's preferred term, every day for the last couple of years. That prompted Obama's discussion on aerial phenomena. He said, what is true, and I'm actually being serious here, is that there is footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. We can't explain how they move, their trajectory. They did not have an easily explainable pattern. And so, you know, I think that people still take seriously trying to investigate and figure out what it is. But I have nothing to report to you today. Now, let me tell you why this is important. A former president of the United States in Barack Obama, who has denied this topic, denied it ever since he was eight years into the White House. If you go back in 2015, when he was on Jimmy Kimmel, he said point blank that he tried to look into the UFO phenomena, but there was nothing there. Nothing, zero zilch. And now he's talking like there was. It doesn't matter. This isn't a Republican thing. This isn't a Democrat thing. This is an American thing. The president lied. He lied. And if you listen to his speech, he will say the same thing. You know, and he stutters through it until he gets to the point where 
he re he says the paragraph I just read to you. And then he is smooth as silk. And then he goes ad-libbing again, trying to downplay the story. It's easy to say that he is in the know, has been in the know, and nobody is pressing him on that. Where five years ago, he was telling people, no, no, I know nothing about this topic. And now he's saying exactly what UFOs are. That's a reality, people, that you as American citizens, whether you're Republican, whether you're Democrat, whether you're Libertarian, should be concerned with. Now, you can sit there and say, oh, well, maybe he didn't know while he was in office, and he's just learning as we go because he still has top secret clearance. No, he knew. And then we can say on the joking side, well, really, a politician lies? This is the president on a major story that involves the United States military for right now. He lied to the American public. And that needs to be called out by the media. It doesn't take a body language expert and a vocal expert to be able to pick up what he said. And that interview was with James Corden. It can be found on YouTube. But I'm serious about it. Go back and look at it. You will see a former president lying to the people. Seriously. I would be upset. Next month, U.S. intelligence services are due to deliver a groundbreaking report on unidentified aerial phenomena to Congress, compiled by the Secretary of Defense and Director of National Intelligence. It's expected to declassify Pentagon knowledge about unexplained aerial objects at a time when encounters between UFOs and U.S. Navy fighter jets have been sending chills through the nation. Often dismissed as made-up ramblings of predominantly rural-dwelling attention seekers, a decade and a half of encounters by the Navy's top fighter pilots and mysterious objects have been tracked by sophisticated sensors and are generating some real attention. Sec uh, you know, so are UFO sightings reflected in the unease emanating from the U.S. Navy cockpits? There's actually a National UFO Reporting Center in the United States, of course. That can be Listen to here on Spaced Out Radio with Michael W. Hall each week. New Fork. Yes. Go check it out. Seriously. What this article is saying is it's time to start taking UFOs seriously. We need to start taking this topic seriously. All right. If you're still a disbeliever, and look, the people in my chat rooms already believe. So here I am speaking to the people on our six terrestrial radio stations, those on our digital who do not understand the phenomena or the size of the phenomena. Look, it's time to open up the eyes. We got something seriously happening in our skies. We have a president, a former president, pardon me, who is lying about this topic, about what he knows publicly. We're being told it's a threat, even though Using the word threat is what gets money put into the project through Congress. Okay, we got something going on. Pay attention to June 25th. I don't think anything exciting is going to happen, but there's some real stuff going on. And we, we will continue to cover that story here on Spaced Out Radio. Here's a weird one. I don't know where Captain Shirk found this one, but we're going to run with it. If a tree farts in the forest, does it make a sound? The answer is no, but it does add a smidge of greenhouse gas to the atmosphere. Yes, apparently dead trees fart. Dead trees. Yes. And they account for roughly one-fifth of the greenhouse gases. I better not tell Justin Trudeau this because he will put a carbon tax on these trees for farting. Well, they emitted by skeletal marshy forests along the coast of North Carolina, researchers report. I'm sure, it's happening in Canada here too. While these emissions pale in comparison with other sources, an accurate accounting is necessary to get a full picture of where climate warming gases are coming from. A team of ecologists went sniffing for tree farts in ghost forests 
which form when salt water from rising sea levels poisons a woodland, leaving behind a marsh full of standing dead trees. These phantom ecosystems are expected to expand with climate change, but it's unclear exactly how they contribute to the world's carbon budget. The emergence of ghost forests is one of the biggest changes happening in response to sea level rise, said Karen Gadan, a coastal ecologist at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., who is not involved in the work. As forests convert to wetlands, and we expect over long time scales, that's going to represent a substantial carbon sink, she says, since wetlands store more carbon than forests, but in the short term, dead trees decay and stop taking up carbon monoxide, dioxide, pardon me, through photosynthesis. So that's what's going to be a major greenhouse gas source. So now we got to worry about not only cows farting, but dead trees farting. Look, everything farts on this planet. You can't tax someone's ass. You just can't. It's impossible. And the damn cows and trees don't pay taxes. They don't. They just sit there all smug. I'm not paying that. No. Let the humans do it. Anyways, to better understand how ghost forests pass gas into the atmosphere, researchers measured greenhouse gases wafting off of dead trees and soil in the five ghost forests on the Albermale Pamlico Peninsula in North Carolina. It is kind of eerie out there, says Melinda Martinez, a wetlands ecologist. But Martinez ain't afraid of no tree ghosts. No, she measured CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide emissions from dead trees using a portable gas analyzer. She towed it on her back. I definitely look like a ghostbuster, she said. And she said it just that monotone. I definitely look like a ghostbuster. Anyways, dead trees are farting. They're causing emissions. We're probably going to get taxed for it because these trees just won't fall down. And people, if, if you're in a swamp area, cut them down. Seriously, use it for good forest firewood. Not forest firewood, but firewood. How about that? Scary one for this family dog. Duke the Black Labrador was just hanging out in his front yard in Ware's Cave, Virginia last week when he was swept off his feet by a dust devil. Security footage from the house shows the 70-pound pup flying several feet through the air as the short-lived air tunnel swept through his neighborhood. Luckily, Duke's owner, Brittany, uh, has said that the pooch was slightly startled, but he's doing just fine. It's still very tough to imagine that, you know, a 70-pound dog or close to it, and how you know, you don't see that every day. You just don't see dogs fly. How would you? How would that have happened? Well, he just kind of looked around as he was shaken up for a minute, but, you know, he went right back to playing with the kids right after. A dust devil forms when the ground becomes much warmer than the air immediately above it. This forms an area of low pressure, which prompts the surrounding area to rush in and fill that void. Particles of dust or sand are raised from the ground due to high-speed winds. The particles form a whirling column like a tornado that is usually relatively small in diameter. They are also referred to as sand whirls or whirlwinds. The agency says they usually develop on a clear, dry, hot afternoon during the spring and summer. Dust devils are more common in dry climates, but they can occur near anywhere. They typically last only a few minutes, and they rarely cause minor damage to trees or buildings. We get those up here near the studio. Had one in my backyard. Took my son's hat right off his head. Yeah, he didn't know what to do. It was kind of funny, actually. Eerie, but funny. Hundreds of people lined up outside the abandoned gas station in California for the chance to get up close and personal with a rare plant known as a corpse flower. The corpse flower, scientifically known as Amorphophallus titanum, belongs to gardener Solomon Leva, who brought this plant to the old Art Deco gas station in Alameda to share with the community. The plant, which only blooms once every several years, is known as the corpse flower due to its pungent odor it releases while blooming. So great, this thing's farting now, and it's going to be taxed for its carbon. It produces a tree-like root-looking plant with a really wide canopy, Leva said. It produces it over and over every year until the bulb has sort of enough energy for it to bloom. This could take 10 years. It could take 15. It could take 20 years. Leva said he wanted the community to have a chance to get up close and personal with the plant, which normally can be only seen from blooming at facilities where the public is kept separated from the plant by barriers. I think 
It's everyone stripping out that they can walk up and wiggle it and smell it. A lot of fun for everybody. Leva estimated that at least 1,400 people had lined up to see the plant so far. Yeah, he's going to get busted for that. They got big emissions rules in California. He's going to get some, some taxes on that. Alan Minish in Anchorage, Alaska is lucky to be alive. Here he was alone surveying land for a real estate agent in a wooded remote part of Alaska, putting some numbers into his GPS unit when he looked up and there in front of them was a large brown bear walking about 30 feet away. I saw him. He saw me at the same time. And it's scary, Minish said, as he was talking from his hospital bed in Anchorage, where Alaska's greatest athlete, Emily Bigelow, lives. Anyways, so what happened? Well, apparently these two had an argument. And let's just say it left Mr. Minish in the hospital. Yeah, he, he called the bear fat, called it ugly, said, look, you don't look like you could kick the ass of a, of a doe deer, let alone a human. Well, the bear took offense to this, literally took his claw, smacked him on the head, bit him on the forehead, all right? This was a brawl. It was a brawl for it all. Minish almost lost his life. The mauling left him with a crushed jaw, a puncture wound in his scalp so deep that the doctors could see the bone, lacerations, and many stitches after four and a half hours of surgery. He was also wearing a patch over his right eye and says the doctors are worried about it. All that happened during the encounter he estimated lasted less than 10 seconds. This is why you don't mess with bears in the wild. You don't call them fat. You don't call them ugly. All right. You don't sit there and say, hey, you, come on over here. Let me hit you with a steel chair. Doesn't work. If It's like being in the ocean with a great white. All right. It's going to eat you. Grizzly bears are not happy. They're like house cats, cranky house cats of the forest. Them and cougars. They just don't like anybody. All right. Anyways, the bear, which Minish said was larger than 300 pounds, yeah, charged and closed the ground between them within a couple of seconds because their bears are actually really fast. As the bear neared him, Minish held up and pointed the end of his survey pole, threatening him, I'm going to smash you with this. And the bear said, screw you. I'm going to take this and I'm going to smash you. The brawl was on. Minish ends up in the hospital after getting pinned on the forest floor. One, two, three. It was over. Just like that. Now he's got the scars to prove it. Thought of the day happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages, then read your responses on the air because the audience participation loves it around here. Today's thought of the day is as follows. Thank you, Bigfoot Rob. What's our question? Let's get to it. I got so excited about that bear story, I forgot to pull it up. Not going to lie. That was fun. I mean, the guy is lucky to be alive. Let's be honest. How far back do you think aliens have been visiting Earth? Today's thought of the day. Start with Steam Train Mark in Australia. How's tomorrow looking? Please give us an update to see if we're alive. He says, way before we were crawling back around this rock, Mark Miller, since they put us here, Haunted history, B.C., at least since the building of the pyramids, probably sometime before. Can't see how humans alone built those things. Ronnie, ultra-terrestrials have been coming here since the beginning. Always. Julian, before or after the Big Bang? I don't know. You tell me. John, I, I don't understand this. He's like quoting a book. All right. All right. Starman, since they discovered it? Muse, ever since they terraformed it. Lucy Bell, since the beginning of time, I would not be surprised if megalithic structures found on Earth were built by ancient extraterrestrial, highly technologically advanced races. Additionally, others may be indigenous to this planet that we are not aware of in our oceans and mountains. John, for millions of years, perhaps. Alien Dank, four billion plus years. Sharuz, junk DNA is the marker. To this day, they are discovering the function of it. Bruce, well, I pretty much established it is at least 788,000 years. If you ever want me to refresh folks on my mind, 
When why I'm so confident, just let me know. Lynn, been here since ancient times. John, probably uh, about 100,000 years. Hunter Red X, beginning of the human race. Mary, since the dinosaurs at least. Jules, from time immemorial. Okay. Joseph, long before mankind's existence. And let's go. UAP fella, all the way back. All the way back when? Matthew, since Prometheus. All right, let's move on. And let's go here. Well, we got some good comments here. Magnus, since before humans were homo sapiens, I think the Anunnaki created us. I agree with you. Danny, long before modern day man, probably since the caveman. Ock might have something to say about that. Nikki, from the moment an extraterrestrial civilization realized Earth was an unexplored planet long before humans were ever seated on the planet. DA, my guess is throughout history. Peter, they've always been here. Lori, 250,000 years, according to a savant experiencer I work with. Kate believes they've been here forever. Davey, they've always been here. Elaine says, always. Bill Hauser believes that too. For a long time, says John. Becky, do doubt, uh, I doubt at least since the 1940s, but possibly even earlier. Sir can. No one has seen them coming. If you encounter a never-seen-before insect in the rainforest, do you automatically assume it is visiting Earth? Good point. Drew, always since times of illusion, and the answers you could receive are virtually infinite. Scott, thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of years. Alfred believes forever. Thomas, since they artificially inseminated the Virgin Mary. Oh, that might not go over good with the Catholics. Gary Vorey is going to be a guest here soon. If they are real... Then always. Robert, they've always been here and humanity has never been alone. Captain Shirk, most likely since the beginning of Earth time. How fascinating to watch it develop. Thank you to everybody participating in the Thought of the Dave on Facebook and Twitter. We will do it all again and on our next show because that's what we do every show here. Thank you so much for Captain Shirk and the great SOR Newswire in helping us bring the news to the public because that's what we do here on a nightly basis. And to Corey Daniel for hanging on out, talking everything weird and strange with the Phoenix Enigma. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thaw rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, at work, in your cars, wherever you may be. Thank you to everyone tuning us in on Twitch, YouTube, LGAP, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and Derek and the Starcats dancing away, doing the polka at hashtag Spaced Out Radio on Twitter. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us, because together, my friends, say it with me, Roy, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them, too. Good night. Woohoo! Good show. Good show. Good radio right there. Hi, awesome Annie Svensson. Super Quest. How you doing, buddy? How's work tonight? Good stuff there.
Good stuff. I just got to check something here. Bear with me. You know, we've been downloaded 3.275 million times. There's an interesting Spaced Out Radio uh, tip for you. Hey, Third Face, how you guys doing, man? Good to see you. Is it 9 o'clock there right now? 9 o'clock? Captain Shirk says, you are such an, a good broadcaster. She couldn't even call me awesome. Damn it, Shirky Poo. You are such a good broadcaster, and you are very welcome. Oh, Captain Shirk. You know what I forgot to do? I've Two things I forgot to do during the show. I forgot to put this on. I don't know why it just doesn't sit there full time. But I also forgot to do this for the news. There's Shirky Poo. There she is. We love her around here. We love her. <clears throat> That's Captain Shirk right there. Look how beautiful Captain Shirk is. Smoking Joe, what's happening, man? Thank you. Way too kind. Way too kind. Hey, Blake, my hair is almost as long as yours now. Almost. I've almost caught up again. <clears throat> Let's get rid of that, 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 that. Now let's go like that and get rid of that. That was a fun show. All right, there we go. Let's go like this quickly. No, didn't do that. Let's do this. There we go. I'm almost there. Now I can see you guys again. Oh, Brutus, you're way too kind. Way too kind. Thanks, Sinister Vax. Appreciate you. Thanks, Nikki. Omuamua, thank you for joining us in the chat room and finally having the opportunity to listen while you're awake. We appreciate that. Fun times, man. It is fun times. Okay, so there's the end. And 
and cut that there. So where is the start? Is it here? Well, um, I can say it's off. Is this the start of the show? There it is. If you're new, hit that thumbs up. Hit that... God, I hate the sound of my voice sometimes. Can't figure it out. Can't figure it out. Sounds so nasally. Oh, yeah, Duke's here every night. Yeah, Shadow Rider. We need a haka. Uh, that will be up to uh, our Aussie and New Zealand uh, listeners to create a spaced out radio haka. We would appreciate that. Well, thank you, Longhorn Paranormal. Is this Kim? Is it Kim? Oh, look who's here. Mr. Cowley. Da, da, da. Welcome back to the show. Oh, Mr. Cowley. Loves his spaced out radio. Love it. Love it. You have no idea how much I like doing that. Thank you, gorgeous Jenster. That's why I love you. You always got me on, on, uh, you know, always building me up. I just got to think of the second stanza, though, for the song. The only thing I know about Mr. Cowley is it's morning where he is because he's in the United Kingdom. Where in the UK, I have no idea. I heard every now and again he runs around with a bobby hat on. I don't know if that's true or not. Portsmouth. Very nice. I don't even know where Portsmouth is, but it sounds good. Sounds real good. Body is so sore right now. Weather patterns are changing. <clears throat> I don't think Longhorn Paranormal is still here. I think they pulled out, Vin. I do. I think they pulled out. Kim from Longhorn, get back in here. I officially start my guitar lessons next week. My son's two weeks in. He's already learning smoke on the water.
Oh God. It's my ankles, my wrists, my knees, my hips, my shoulders. Fuck. You'd be paying a lot of money, dude. $5 a joint. Holy cow. Am I getting sore? That's why I love the winter time. Like, even though it's like horribly cold here, my body never hurts. So does a thin neck uh, on a guitar, AZ boy. <clears throat> so does a thin neck on a guitar. It's a beauty. I just picked up an LT an ESP LTD guitar today off of Facebook Marketplace. I think it's a cheap one, but um let's see if i can find the serial i i gotta check the serial number on it but um it's another red one and i got my court the one thing i like about them is i do have smaller hands and it's um they got smaller necks um, they're not as big as a, as a les paul or even my my jay terser right here it's got a really wide neck <clears throat> Sure, Nikki. I'd love to. Thank you. On my birthday, which is Monday. Uh, Brutus, thank you so much for the super chat, man. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Very nice. You're awesome, man. I love how you guys support us. I really do. Really does mean the world. Hi, Wizard Grin. How are you tonight? Alan and Shiny Ray Crickets. Hey, Alan, how you doing? How's your mustache, Alan? Even if you don't have one, make up a story. Oh, third phase. Good dudes, you didn't have to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind, guys. Very kind. That is really nice. Thank you so much. Uh, good night, Cr Crow Creek. Who's tomorrow on the show? Let me just... I know. I think we're getting into some woo tomorrow night. I think we might be. All right. Uh, Ivan Teller tomorrow night. Ivan Teller. Well, that's not what I wanted. That's what I wanted right there. Give me two secs, guys.
Oh, good night, Sinister Vax. Appreciate you. Excuse me. Oh. God, my hair says I'm preparing to go for an 80s dance party at the local nightclub. I don't know, Vinster. <clears throat> Vinster, I'm bringing you on on my birthday show. Bringing you on. Oh, yeah. I'm just, uh, I'm going to bring anybody who wants to come in and I'm going to post the link uh, up here. And whoever wants to come in <sighs> can click the link and come on the air with us. That's what we're going to do. Yeah, make sure you get your comb over just perfect, Vin. You might have to go into Grandpa's stash of Brill Cream in order to make it happen. Bigfoot Michigan Rob. He might come in. No, I'm dead serious, Vin. I'm dead serious. I want to comb over. Yep. Gorgeous Stephanie Jackson is coming on in. Mondak the Destroyer is coming in. You know, I would totally add a haka to our intro, but I don't want to be disrespectful. 
Uh, Gorgeous Larry, I could tell you an exact update on your shirt, buddy. It hasn't been printed yet. Yes. I was telling uh, Bombshell Bomber, because she's waiting too, uh, the other night. That is why I am getting rid of my shirt person, and I'm waiting for my final orders to be made, and then we're going back to an online store. I'm uh, Apparently, me putting trying to put money in her pocket is not a priority. Hard to believe that um, she's uh, in business. But yeah, four months, four months. I'm still waiting for nine shirts, maybe 10. Vin, if I bring in Geraldine, you better have your hair brill creamed. You better have your mustache waxed and you better be wearing your best velvet bow tie that you can find, my friend. And I'm not talking about you dressing up in one of those tuxedo t-shirts. Not talking about that at all. Yes, I remember, Bomber. I remember... Even Duke's going to come by and say hello. You know, Duke, I finally figured out who you look like. You look like Michael Anthony, bass guitarist of Van Halen or former bass guitarist of Van Halen. I bet you got a Jack Daniels bass guitar hanging out somewhere in your house. And that's a compliment. Just remember, if you're coming in on uh, the YouTube channel on Monday for my birthday, if you plan on it, because the link will be up, uh, that you will be on camera. All right? So if you do anything silly, I am going to cut you off ASAP. But I know you won't because you people are really cool. And, yeah, it'll be good. Boy, I sounded like my mother there. If you do this, David, David. Yes, mother. David. Oh, I can't give my mom a hard time right now. She's gone through some health issues. Hey, Fabster, that's also the one that comes with with platform shoes. He's got the two inch platforms on those as well. I hope you are ordering the beard oil bin. Gary would be happy. Decatus, what's happening? Oh, Decatus uh, is willing to lend out his full body denim bodysuit. Who wants that? Who wants that for the show? <clears throat> Please respond. Magnus, in your case, if you have a bald head, yes, it would it would be legal. We'd call that legal. Decatus, if you could cut the 
the portion actually if it's a bodysuit you're literally sliding into it so fabster could wear that because he won't have to try and get his head through the head hole so i think fabster may do that All right, Ozzy, Ozzy, you have a good day. Have a great weekend, buddy. Four fifty five PM there. Oh, hold on, there's twelve hours. Plus four. So he's fourteen and a half hours ahead of us. Hey, Steam Train Mark, thank you for letting us know. Uh, shadow time. Uh, I was in an email conversation with, uh, Grant Cameron, Melinda Leslie. We were talking about it. I haven't responded yet. And Nicole Sackage. Now in that, um, he Greer states that the, that the, uh, video had been taken down where she and makes the comments. It hasn't been taken down. I don't know where he came from that. I think Dr. Greer is worried about his own relevance and paycheck in regards to what's happening with Ella. Oh, excuse me. Oh, sorry. With Elizondo and, um, and with Daniel Sheehan and that relationship. I think he's trying to put his uh, foot down, reminding Daniel that you're on Team Greer, not Team Elizondo. And Greer's like, I'm not here on Team Greer or Elizondo. I'm on Team both, and we're all here for the same cause to get the message out. I mean, don't forget that Daniel Sheehan helped bring down Richard Nixon back in the day. He was part of the legal team at Watergate. I think Greer is trying to figure out his own relevance in the way this is moving. He's made a lot of money and a lot of famous friends being the UFO Anthony Robbins. Jacques Vallée, he's still the master. Excuse me.
Uh, Greer says he has something to add to it. I haven't figured out if he's trying to downplay Elizondo's work. I mean, if he's trying to call him a shill or a disinformation agent, because there's rumors about that going around too. I don't know. My hair is getting long. It's getting long. That's not bad. Hair tips by Dave. How to turn yourself into a gnome. I wonder if I can get that to stand. Hold on. Let's try. Let's see if we can get this to stand. I have before. I'm doing this for you, Fap. Just to show you how much my head is thinning. Oh, no, almost. Damn, it fell over. Oh, wrong way. There we go. Well, that's oh, it looks like a pancake. I look like a sumo wrestler. Not working. Okay, that one's done, that one's done, and this one is done. All right, everyone. I'm going to say goodnight to you. Big thank you to all of our new subscribers that signed up tonight. Thank you to Bigfoot Rob, to uh, Third Phase of Moon, Brutus, Michelle in Australia, Aiden, Jeremy, Catfish, and John for the awesome Super Chats tonight. Thank you to all the veterans who listen to our show on a nightly basis. We absolutely love you. And thank you to all of our regulars who come into the chat room each and every night. You guys are amazing. We'll see you tomorrow, nine, tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. Because together, my friends, say it with me, we own the night.